all of everybody to this meeting, both councillors, officers, representatives from Southern Water and the members of the general public who have submitted questions for this meeting and also those who are watching online via the YouTube channel. Need to confirm that this meeting is being minuted, recorded and live streamed via YouTube and that it will be published on the Council's YouTube channel. Tonight we have Susie Wakeham, Director of People and Places, Matthew Young, Foreshore Manager, Pippa, Andrew and Manessa are here providing support from our democratic services. I'd like to thank Southern Water for attending tonight and we have Ian McCauley who's the Chief Executive Officer, Lawrence Godston who's the Director of Wastewater and Asset Management, Barry Woodham who's Bathing Water Manager, Nick Mills who is Head of Storm Overflow Task Force and Toby Willison who's the Director of Environment and Sustainability. So thank you very much for a joining us tonight everybody. So what I need to do before we go any further with the questions, I need to inform the councillors that this is a special meeting of the community committee and it is there for questions and answers only. We will not be taking any decisions tonight as it is a virtual meeting. If the councillors or officers wish to speak, they will use the in-meeting text chat facility to let the meeting know. As we know, there's quite a few questions from the public, and we also know that we're answering questions thematically. So what I would like to ask councillors to do is wait for the members of the public's questions to be presented and answered, and then questions on those themes, if you can just type speak in the text box, we can keep a record of who was going to speak and in what order. So if that's possible, could you do that? Please don't write your questions in the text box, Firstly, it will mean it's quite difficult for us to keep track of who's due to speak next and no member of the public will actually see the text box. So there's, there's no point making points there. It is just for us, okay? I may seek or receive advice from the council officers during a meeting on procedural, legal or technical matters by way of an electronic messaging during this meeting or by telephone during an adjournment. If a live streaming to the council YouTube channel fails, the meeting will be adjourned for up to 15 minutes to see if it can be restored. If it cannot be restored, we will continue to record and the meeting will be uploaded to the website as soon as possible afterwards. The councillors need to leave a meeting for any reason or have technical difficulties. They should use the text chat facility to notify the meeting if possible. The democratic services officers or I will then inform a meeting where necessary. If a councillor's connections becomes lost for more than a few seconds, the meeting may adjourn for up to five minutes to allow the connection to be reinstated. We will take a brief adjournment for a rest break at a suitable point in the proceedings if this meeting looks like it's lasting more than two hours. Okay, so firstly, apologies. Pippa, have there been any apologies for absence? Sorry, Chair, before we do that, we just need to take a roll call, please. If we can just okay. ask Andrea to take a roll call with councillors present. Yep, certainly. Um, bear with me. Okay. Councillor Baker. Present. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Present. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Present. Thank you. Councillor Cornell. Chris, you're Councilor muted. Cornell. You're muted, sorry. <laughs> I'm present, just a little yes. bit normal. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dance. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dawkins. I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Decker. Present. Thank you. Councillor Harvey Quirk. Present. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Councillor Howes. Present. Thank you. Councillor Kenny. Present. Thank you. Councillor Maslin. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Sol. Present. Thank you. That's all done. Thank you. Pippa, have we received any apologies for tonight's meeting? An apology from Councillor Butcher. Thank you. Therefore, who is substituting for Councillor Butcher tonight? Councillor Kenny. Thank you. Next, we look at interest. Pippa, could you re read any interest received in advance? Uh, no interests have been received for the meeting. 
Thanks. Can I ask any councillors if they wish to declare any further interest at this point? If they do, can they please type speak into the text chat? Thank you, Neil. Thank you. I should declare that I live within um, smelling distance of the Swelcliffe wastewater treatment. So I've been impacted by odour from there for most of the 40 years of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Uh, yes, I'm uh, the chairman of the Beach Heart Owners Association in Herne Bay. Um, uh, I also am the peer manager. Um, uh, and although it's not necessary, I'm going to work, use the word that I also do coordinate events as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sol. It may not be relevant, but I am a member of the River Stour Internal Drainage Board. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Yes, I declare that uh, I swim for in excess of six months of the year in a, on a daily basis in our coastal waters. Thank you. OK, if there are no further interests now, I will just say if anybody has interest which come up during the course of the meeting, can you please let us know before you speak on that matter? Thank you. Next, we have item four, which is public participation. I believe there are two video submissions for this meeting. There are also a number of written questions that have been submitted before the meeting. These will be read out by Andrea. So item five, can I please ask Andrea to play any audio or video questions which have been submitted? Yes, Thank we have you. two video questions, so I'll do that now for you, Chair. I'll just try that again. It's not working, so I'll try another time, OK? OK, thank you. I'll try again. Let me know if you want me to try, Andrea. I'm Rachel Carnack, the Ward Councillor for Reculver and Deputy Leader of the Council. It has been helpful to set up a working group with Southern Water to look at the issues in East Hern Bay and the impact of spills on Reculver Country Park, and I'm grateful to you and your colleagues for working with residents and councillors. Would you outline the investment plans for the Gainsborough Drive pumping station and ways to mitigate the impact of CSO releases on the triple SI at Bishopston Glen? I understand that mechanical failures are frequently caused by rag, face wipes and the like. What steps can be taken to reduce these failures? And would you consider attenuation schemes to reduce the impact on the Glen? Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Claire Turnbull from the Green Party. I was elected to serve the Goral Whitstable Ward on the 18th of November last year, 70 days ago. Since then, Southern Water has released raw sewage into our local seas on 45 of those days, the total release time being 155 hours. 
Do not underestimate the impact sewage releases are having on our town. Besides the health concerns of users such as swimmers, sailors and paddleboarders, this is affecting local businesses. Confidence in traditional Whitstable seafood has plummeted. Local people and visitors are distressed and confused by the mixed messages about water safety and concerned about reports of illness from swimming or eating seafood. Many people in Whitstable are so fed up with the sewage dumping that they've stopped paying their bills to Southern Water until it sorts its act out. The target date that Southern Water has set to eliminate this pollution is not until 2040. This is far too slow. We in the Green Party will be running a programme of citizen science water testing in the coming weeks so we can map the presence of bacteria against sewage outage information. Now we're not stupid, we know that this is not as robust as the testing carried out by the Environment Agency, but at the moment it's all we have. I have two questions. When are Southern Water going to fund a proper programme of testing which can be clearly communicated to everyone so that we can make proper judgments about when it is safe to be in the sea and eat Whitstable seafood? And what are Southern Water doing right now to stop this pollution of our beaches? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrea, for playing those videos. What I'd now like to do is invite Southern Water to respond to the questions raised in those videos. Firstly, the questions raised by Councillor Karnak regarding the investment within her ward, and then Councillor Turnbull's questions regarding Whitstall. So I don't know who's going to speak first from Southern Water. Um, we have a presentation which summarises uh, some of these things as well. So I don't know if we maybe want to have that on screen um, or not in terms of overall investment and investment in various catchment areas. Uh, what would you prefer? My preference would be because a lot of the questions are going to be regarding investment in different areas. So if you would like to do the presentation first and then if the questions which have been asked aren't covered by your presentation perhaps you could follow up if that's possible okay so i think what we'll do is that there's a number of slides here we're not going to use them all we'll just go through quickly try and touch on key areas so things like storm overflows what's been done what we're committing to uh, and try and pick up questions as we go then we'll pause i think uh, just to make sure we have covered them so um barry can you share i can't ian unfortunately i'm on my because my laptop isn't supporting Google. All right. Can let me, let me try Google? again. Do this. Hang on. I'm just going to join from my laptop and do that. Okay. So I think there are, for everybody on the call, there are two or three different aspects in terms of the total investment, the five year regulatory periods, specific investments, and in as well, what are storm overflows? How are they being treated? Um, I was in National Infrastructure Commission. Uh, this morning, looking at how we might look at stormwater separation, which again is very important uh, in relation to all of this as well. So hopefully we'll be able to touch on this from the um, higher level and then get into very specific areas as well, as and when. Um, Nick, are you there yet? Hopefully. You see that? Yes, yep. thank you, Nick. Put it to slideshow, Nick, that would probably be helpful. Now, I think I think this will cover a number of the questions that we've seen as we've gone through, but I'm very conscious of time. We want to make sure that we're having the right discussion with people. Um, so if I put this in the, the general context of what, what's been spent overall, and then we'll drop into local areas. Nick, can you get that slideshow to make it a little bit bigger? It is on my screen. But <laughs> uh, it's not, <laughs> not on this one. All right, okay. hang on. Let me try again. Okay. I'll make it bigger like this. That's fine. I think, can people read that okay? Yeah, I can. Yeah, it looks if, good. Yeah. Okay, so if I, just um, for people's, and hopefully this gives general understanding of the say, so please stop me if we, if we know this, but um, we are funded in five-year cycles uh, and funded by our economic regulator, um, off what, who set price limits uh, and bills for us. Um, in our five-year cycle, which runs from, 2020 to 2025, we were funded at around £3.7 billion. Pounds. Um, we have, some of you may have seen in the last year, um, quite clear that we needed to spend more than that, um, given some of the issues we faced, uh, some of the historical problems as well. So 
uh, towards the end of last year, um, the, the autumn time, we were able to secure an additional equity investment into the company of a billion pounds. Um, and that billion pounds coming in from Macquarie Asset Management is all coming into the operational company. Um, none of it is leaving with the uh, exiting shareholders. Um, that's going to take our investment up to about £4.2 billion pounds in the five-year period. Um, that is over and above uh, what we have got from our bills. Um, key areas to be looking at from that is actually digitising our network so that we can see more of the network to get to pollutions before they happen. Several hundred million pounds invested in a centralised control centre with AI and data analysis Again, to looking at things like seeing in our networks where levels are rising, where pumps are starting to struggle, which might indicate a pollution is coming, uh, and also to improve our operational response. Next slide, please, Nick. So if we look to how our money is actually spent, um, you can see there the breakdown uh, in that. Um, so roughly, rough bills roughly a pound and four pence per day. Uh, and split down into 40p for OPEX, uh, 47p on CAPEX, 3p on taxes, uh, 16p on bill set, uh, debt servicing, uh, and which ensures that we keep our bills low uh, by effectively managing our funding. So that's how the, the, the investment splits up. Uh, I would stress that as a company, um, and this did not make me popular, we have not paid a dividend externally now for more than three years. Uh, and all of the money is going into the asset base. And the new owners have supported that approach. They will expect a dividend in future, um, but they are making sure they're investing in the asset base at the present moment in time. Next slide, please, Nick. <clears throat> Some key targets in terms of the things that we are setting out to do. So in terms of storm overflows, we currently have 98% of our spill pathways are measured and mapped which is more than any of the other companies. Um, we are looking to improve that to 100%. In terms of storm overflows as well, we are perhaps unusual in the industry that we have stood and said that we support the amendments to the Environment Bill uh, and that we would like to target storm overflows quicker, more proactively, with different types of investment and approaches to try to achieve an 80% reduction uh, by 2030. Now, Nick uh, is leading that team We've set up a dedicated storm task force to try to improve that as well. We recognise a very different scenario in the southeast, in that much of the debate inland is about bathing waters and whether rivers should be bathing waters. We don't have that debate. All of our waters are bathing waters, and therefore it's about storm overflows for us. We recognise the significance and the importance, most particularly, and I accept that some people are all year round swimmers but our biggest storms are now coming in the summer. So it's a concern for us, as it is for you, in terms of impacts on tourism, to try to get those numbers down. Um, in addition, looking at pollution overall, we're targeting zero by 2040, the investments that we have. We're also targeting water consumption reduction uh, to 100 litres per head per day, again by 2040, and moving to a system of systems approach for water management in particular, surface water separation being a key focus for us in terms of reducing number of pollutions and reducing flooding as well. So next slide, Nick. Um, I think that's kind of stuff that we have talked about already. We, we did put a new uh, defence model in, three-line defence, a new code of ethics uh, approach and making sure that we are fundamentally reporting better and differently. Uh, one of the proofs to that would be, hopefully, you will be able to have seen that the Environment Agency, we are now the highest reporting company in terms of self-reporting of any pollution event that we report. We're now into, I think it's 90% now, Lawrence, uh, which makes us the best company now. Okay. Um, and a commitment to improving communication. Witness these type of meetings of wanting to engage on the big issues with you in terms of how we make it better. Keep going, Nick. Uh, these are the investments, Lawrence. Shall I hand it over to you in terms of the investments in and around the wastewater assets? Yeah, sure. I'm very, very happy to. I mean, the lion's share of investment has been into Swirlcliff, and we're 
uh, right in the middle of finalising those those investments now. Um, Swirlcliff has had a pretty much a root and branch overhaul. Um, some of the most material elements of that 25 million have been increasing the capacity for the long sea outfall pumps. Um, there is a very long outfall um, coming out of Swell, Swellcliff, and it's very important that outfall is able to take the full capacity of treated final, what we call final effluent, but that is the recycled water that comes on through the wastewater tr treatment works. Um, that actually is ultraviolet disinfected, um, and that now safely goes through that long sea outfall because we've refurbished all of the pumps and increased their capacity. So some, some of those in investments have meant that we have uh, radically um, stopped some of the overflows that were occurring, particularly into, into the brook. And most importantly, um, hopefully you will welcome the news that I can share with you, that we have also now sealed off that overflow um, adjacent to the treatment works on, on the brook. So we fulfilled a commitment that we had to the local community um, and to some of your, your colleagues who we, we, we've met with down at Swellcliff um, to seal off that overflow. It is now sealed. Um, that was a very important part of um, an increasing, putting tanks on site to increase our ability to be able to hold water in the event of a storm. So there are a number of other elements there, but, but chiefly this slide is all about the investments we've made to make sure that the existing sewage treatment works and pumping stations in the area are all working to their optimal performance. Separately, um, we are planning to make significant investments in the Swellcliff area to separate surface water and remove the um, threat of overflows, which I think everybody understands are there to protect local communities from flooding, but very understandably, and we entirely support this, are not acceptable now in this day, day and age. But that is more about our, our surface water separation work, which we'll talk to you just in, in a couple of slides time. This is all about making sure the existing assets work effectively 24 seven. And this is the level of investment we have almost concluded. Um, just very quickly on top of this, we have also been um, investing in odour control, particularly at Swellcliff. We're very conscious of the impact that ODA has on the local community and have had a number of meetings with the local community about that. Um, we have done a whole load of ODA monitoring and we've used that to inform where and particularly what needed um, further ODA enhancement. Now we're probably about a month away from completing th that work but we have added to the existing ODA control capability on site such that local residents should be significantly less impacted in, in the future and quite rightly so. Um, that, that's probably the main, the main point. Um, the next slide I've already really, really covered because some of those points um, I've raised when we were talking, talking through there. Um, talking about um, moving on to the next slide and pick, just picking up how um, the entire catchment works. We've just got a slide there. We can move on to the next slide, please, Nick. Um, that just helps you, just sort of sets out what that um, entire catchment lo looks like. That is, that is a picture of the Swellcliff catchment. It serves a population of 30, 37,000 people. Um, and it consists of um, separate sewers and sewers where we've got stormwater and sewage combined in one pipe. And that in particular is the point that we'll be talking to you later because when it rains and it's raining a lot heavier and a lot more regularly now due, due to climate change than it ever did in the past, particularly summer's now the most difficult point um, for that. It's those sewers which have got a combined surface water with the rainfall and sewers, when they overflow, that's the problem that we're attacking with our sewer separation work. Um, so we'll pick that up a bit more with you in, in a moment. Um, most importantly, bathing water results, moving on to the next slide. And I'll, I'll, I'll let Nick sort of uh, talk you through where we are on bathing water results. But actually, it, it's been really good to see the maintaining of that excellent status and remaining good. We have actually had our, a record breaking um, year for bathing water results. And that's largely due to significant investments over the last two decades. Um, those, those decades have made a massive improvement in bathing water quality, but what we are very cited on is the next big problem for us to tackle is reducing sewer overflows, and we'll come on to that in a, in a minute. Nick, do you, do you want to pick that up further? I was actually going to suggest that Barry takes these slides. 
if you want, yep, Barry. Thank you. I was just a bit Very worried much. about Barry's signal. Barry, are you okay to talk? Is your signal yes, good enough? Of course. Enough? Can you hear me okay? Okay, yeah, we can. Go for it. Thanks, Barry. Thank you very much. Um, just to support what Lauren said, it's it's an improving picture for the bathing water results. The four designated bathing waters in Canterbury maintain their status, which is a really important thing, a really important milestone for us to have got to that stage, but also to involve the the, the key stakeholders in that process as well. As part of my role and a part of the wider Southern Water picture, we're really looking to forge the relationships with key focus groups who can give us the local feedback on bathing water. It helps us understand what improvements we can make. Nick, if you can pop to the next slide quickly, please. Thank you very much. This, this, the, we, we're looking at how we can improve the bathing water. It's a partnership working exercise, but it's a lot of our data we already have in house where we can look at tidal conditions, some of the advance we want to make about analysing the water quality once a spill has taken place. We use the Beach Boy application, which some of you may be familiar with, which links to the bathing waters and will inform of when a spill's taken place, the duration of the actual spill. We're looking to enhance that application to bring online, ultimately, water quality monitoring and, and, and just some signposts about the actual water quality and how the spill's affecting that receiving environment. The further detail in this slide pertains to some of the questions and some of the work we intend to do regards the Gold Stream and the investigations at Whitstable, which we can come on to later in the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, I mean, the misconnections is uh, an incredibly important part of what we do to control and, and is often um, not talked about enough. Um, misconnections, in simple terms, is where either through inadvertent or deliberate mis misuse of connecting existing or new properties to the wrong network. So a new property might be having some modifications or an existing property rather, or a new property might be being plumped into the system. Sometimes that can happen without control. It shouldn't but it is possible, and that means that sewage can enter a surface water system that shouldn't be there. So we have a team dedicated to tracking down those misconnections, those connections that shouldn't be, um, and we then work with local authorities to track down the owners, and either through enforcement action or encouragement, um, we this is a, a continual hunt for us to make sure that those connections are fixed, such that only surface water goes into surface water, pipes and sewage goes into sewage sewage pipes from properties but this is a really important part because a misconnection will be there day in day out it's not during a storm it's not during an overflow so actually tracking down and eliminating these is a really important part of, of our work um, I think now we'd like to move on quickly and take you through the next big um, shift for us which is about uh, removing the threat or removing certainly by 2030 making an 80 percent reduction in overflows and we are going out very strongly ahead of the rest of the uh, the entire water industry and committing to making these kind of ambitious reductions and we've got a plan to back it up uh, dr nick mills is our chief in charge of the team on this and he'll be taking you through the next few slides nick Thanks, Lawrence, and good evening, everybody. So, yeah, I'm, I'm leading the CSO Task Force, the Storm Overflow Task Force. Our objective is to build a plan to hit that 80% uh, reduction uh, of their use by 2030. To do that, we are uh, very much looking at catchment solutions and go right up into the catchment as much as possible. And I'll come on to some of those solutions in a minute, along with optimising uh, our existing networks and, uh, as a last resort, building more infrastructure which we'll talk about later too but to do that we're going to demonstrate these concepts at scale to prove the outcome is possible in five pathfinder catchments one of them is our swell cliff wastewater treatment works uh, catchment um, which hopefully is, is good news for everyone on the call um, and we're in the process of studying that catchment um, and we'll be producing a, an interim report uh, later on this year, which we would like to talk uh, and consult with, uh, hopefully over the summer. So that's where we're at with that. Uh, we're also looking at catchments in Deal, Margate, Sandown on the Isle of Wight, and uh, a number of villages in, near Andover and Hampshire. And these will build effectively a regional-wide plan uh, and an assumption base, so we can cost that regional-wide plan um, 
appropriately um, ready to hit the target in, in our investment period, which is unpaid. But to do that is absolutely essential. We work in partnership. We are talking about solutions uh, that will be on assets and land that Southern Water do not directly control. So to do this, we must work in partnership. And I'll bring that alive a little bit later on. So um, I think we've talked a little bit about this, but hopefully it's, it's, it's pretty common knowledge. These are legacy designs of our combined sewer system they are their essential part of the current design to prevent property from flooding if we do simply block them all up i know we've got one example one being blocked up but uh, to do that we've had to build capacity elsewhere if we block them all up we will potentially produce a flooding and there's some international examples of where that's gone wrong uh, most recent example in alexandria egypt this is an international problem this is not unique to the uk so very quickly explain how the current system works in uh, normal conditions where we're dry wastewater will all flow unless there is an operational issue uh, or a blockage or a pump failure of some sort wastewater will flow through treatment works and it will uh, be treated to a high quality and discharged under environmental permit conditions as rainfall starts to occur that system that combined system will fill with rainwater that comes from roads and roofs Roads and roofs take up most of that non-permeable area that uh, takes the surface water into the combined system. And in this scenario, there is capacity and the, the storm tank is used to buffer that flow when the water, is, the rainwater, is, uh, the storm event or, or rainwater uh, rain event has occurred, has passed, that storm tank will be discharged um, via the treatment works, i.e. treated. In the last scenario, this is where the outfalls or the overflows are, are activated to prevent property from flooding. This is where storm tank capacity is exceeded uh, and there's a discharge. And in this example, this is more extreme. The network has also become overwhelmed and the overflow to the top of the right of the screen has, uh, has started to be used. This is obviously indicative and, and really one of the things that we recognised when we started talking to uh, wider stakeholders and customers about this is uh, some of the terminology we used. Um, doesn't help in translating this and talking talking to people about this. So we've deliberately used the Met Office scale, which is the, the graphic that you can see there on intensity. This challenge, as, as Lawrence and Ian have all said, is, is getting harder in the summer period. We're getting more intense rainfall events in the summer and the data from the Met Office and some independence is backing that up. So we have to solve this problem. Um, and we firmly believe uh, going right up into the catchment is, is the sustainable route. So what sort of things would we do? So just to give you some comparison, a sustainable house, i.e. a house that has got its, is, is naturally drained, has soakaways, for example, for, for the road runoff, for the roof runoff, and has a, a permeable driveway, is only 30% of the wastewater from that house, which includes water over a typical year, actually enters the combined sewer system versus a traditionally connected or sort of legacy housing stock. So quite dramatic and stark difference. And obviously to solve this problem, we're gonna to have to look at that older housing stock to tackle this. Um, here's, a, here's a graphic of some of those solutions. You've got a, a smart water butts, which I'll come on to some examples in a minute. Uh, these are water butts that understand what weather is about to hit them and they'll empty ahead of a storm because the water butt's great, but it has to be empty at the time the storm hits us. Green roofs, naturally draining areas, uh, as much as possible, we want to remove or slow the flow of water that enters our combined system. Really important message, and that's obviously a message people I'm sure have heard with flooding. It's the same concept. Get our water back to a more sustainable uh, um, drainage solution across the patch, and this will help us out. What we have said so far is that that's what we really want to preference. Um, to, to, to do that, we need to work in partnership with others. Uh, as much of this infrastructure will require close partnership working to install sustainable urban drainage solutions. Some of the things that you've got pictured, um, trees are a really good example of where we could work together. I'm sure we've all got tree planting targets. If we put a, a tree in the right street environment and drain the road runoff into that, uh, naturally soak, soaking away the water below the tree uh, and into the ground below the pavement, we can we can potentially pull resources uh, to, to, to deliver those sorts of solutions. And there are lots of examples like that and many more other solutions like that that we can we can do. We really want to be ambitious here and prove it at catchment. No one's really done that. No one's done this at a whole catchment scale before to demonstrate um, benefits to storm overflow discharges. So that's what we really want to do. I told you about the five... Uh, pathfinders where we're hoping to do that 
our initial work um, last year suggested that we do not need to take all of that surface water out and we can be quite targeted of the areas that we need to go to. So that's where we're at at the moment. Um, we've talked about the catchment solutions. There are other ways we can optimise our network. Those new sensors will really help us optimise that. Uh, what is it? pretty much a passive system at the moment and be smarter on how we use our network and its interface with other things. But it, we are not naive to think that we will not need to do some infrastructure. There will be cases where we need to enlarge pipes, put bigger pumps in, uh, tanks and treatment capacity. So the formation of that task force was completed last year. Much of the work is underway in those pathfinders in terms of the study work. Uh, Deal uh, catchment is furthest ahead. Uh, Swellcliffe and Margate, as I said, we will have uh, initial reports um, ready for circulation later this spring and, and for public uh, consultation over the summer period. Uh, that will really um, hopefully uh, get us together around some of the interventions we want to make in the Swellcliffe area. So. I think that was what I wanted to cover. Um, I don't know whether Lawrence wants to cover the next slide regarding pollution. Um, Nick, could I just um, yeah, sure. put people on the call as well of look at the alternatives? Um, if, if this is really important to us in terms of getting your support for our next um, submission for our next price review. Because um, to be clear, the alternative, if, we, if this is to be done as a water utility company deals with it under all of their own steam, then the alternative is we build very, very large concrete boxes. Um, we build bigger wastewater treatment works, and that will be treating dilute effluent, um, which they're not good at because they're biological work. So we will be using significantly more power and more chemicals, um, and we will not be achieving a particularly good environmental result. So bizarrely, some of you might feel we do not want to approach it from that perspective. We want to approach it from the perspective of the combination of nature-based solutions. So, for example, taking some of the road drainage out can be done with swales and reed beds uh, and provides net environmental gain effectively. And at the same time, means that we don't have to add the carbon footprint, build more concrete. So bills will stay down for people uh, and we will achieve a better result. So it's trying to get that combination of the two things in the right place. You may have seen that the Environmental Audit Committee called out highway drainage as well as one of the key areas that has to be addressed. Um, and looking at it in that way, one of the studies that Nick has done, the concrete box type solution, we estimate, and these are very approximate figures, roughly 200 million pounds of NPV uh, and a very high carbon footprint to do it with surface water separation, round about 36 to 40 million pounds um, and net environmental gain. So addressed in that fashion, we believe, and it speaks to the, the question about what are we doing about it, what are we doing about environment, that there are better solutions here. Uh, and that's what we want to put forward. Lawrence, do you want to? Yeah, very happy to. And then I'm conscious here that we probably be, we probably ought to sort of, I don't think maybe we need to do some of the tail end slides. We can wrap up and return to questions. Um, but I do want to pick up a little bit on, on, on this slide. Um, I would entirely um, endorse the fact that we would love to get to zero way earlier than 2040. Um, I think the realistic truth is, is that um, there is a law of diminishing returns. And whilst by, um, by the end of 2025, we will have been able to make something near an 80% reduction on where we were last year, um, over, over a matter of um, th three years. Um, the rest of that 20% is going to have a longer tail on it because we've got to do more and more difficult um, things, as Nick has just been out outlining. But we do believe that the uh, separation of surface water has the potential to accelerate those timescales. Um, but it's just not something that we can put clearly into numbers yet because we need to complete these Pathfinder projects, which are going to inform our approach right across the entire region over the next decade or so. Um, so we do want to get, believe me, we really, really do, on behalf of our communities and customers, we want to get well ahead of that 24, if it is at all humanly possible. I guess the challenge that we just don't know yet is in doing surface water separation, is you're not actually changing a water company's assets. We need to start disconnecting assets that belong to other people. And we don't know how easy or difficult that is going to be until we've completed these we're calling them pathfinders, but really these these um, these uh, trial projects. 
but we are delighted to confirm that one of those, one of the locations is Swellcliff. So Swellcliff will benefit early um, from this Pathfinder approach. So I'm, I'm just conscious that we've been talking for a little while in, and, and I think we've gone through yeah. the real meat of it. Absolutely. So I think we go back to the questions now. Before you go back to the questions and I open it up to councillors, can I please ask, is it possible for you to send the presentation through to either Pippa or Andrea so that it can be sent out to all of the members of the committee so we actually have those for us? Because I know there's a lot of information there for people to take on board. And I think it would be really, really useful to have that so we can look at things in a bit more detail, if that's okay. Absolutely, of course. Yeah. Of course. Thank yeah, you. I'll pop it over in the morning. No problem. Thank you, Lawrence. If, if, Thank it, you. If, if it would help, we'd be happy to pick up any follow-on questions. The more we can generate understanding so that we are gen genuinely working together, in because it is going to need teamwork to be able to solve surface water separation. Um, it's water companies, councils, highway drainage, land drainage boards. We're going to need everybody pulled into that partnership-based approach. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to ask, open up now to councillors. I see Ashley wants to speak. So if anybody else would like to speak based on what we've just heard, could you type in the box? So Ashley, over to you first. You're muted, Ashley. Sorry, two, two quick questions on what we've heard. Um, According to uh, press reports in August, uh, Southern Water was acquired by Macquarie, or rather 51% of uh, Southern Water was required, acquired by Macquarie, an Australian company that previously owned Thames Water from 2006 to uh, 2017 and saddled them with uh, $10.6 in debt removed two billion in dividends and paid no corporation tax. Against that background, how can we realistically believe anything of what you're trying to tell us in respect to improvements? That's question number one. And question number two, what sway have you got with the um, uh, local government department to insist that with the national planning policy framework that uh, separation of surface water is made absolutely obligatory in all new developments because that's the only way we're going to crack it the way ahead. It has to be absolutely compulsory. I know that some developments are planning their own sewage works, but the surface water as you quite rightly point out, is absolutely critical to this. And unless there is a government diktat, uh, all the goodwill in the world that you've uh, exposed tonight uh, is going to get us nowhere. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll pick up first on Lawrence, Nick, others can come in as well. So actually, yeah. you, raise, you raise some good points there. I mean, we, we would like it to be obligatory. Surface water separation for new development should just be done as a matter of course. Um, you probably have more more ability to do that than we do, but we are we are asking for that. Um, perversely, if new housing is built well, it's not actually the problem. Um, Eighty percent of housing that will exist in twenty fifty is already built, and that's where the problem lies. Um, so, trying to get new development to work with offsetting, we're doing a lot with developers in that regard. And again, it's a place where we could work much more closely together um, to try and get surface water out of the existing system would be really helpful as well. Um, if I turn to the Macquarie question, it's a fair, it's a fair question. Um, you know, it is one example, and I think Lawrence was uh, knows him reasonably well. Um, I would also call out that Thames invested in the Thames Tideway for separation and stopping um, outfalls, uh, which was a pretty big and bold investment. They've gone public with letters. Um, they've agreed and they've published them. They're on the websites uh, in terms of their commitments. Um, they've put a billion pounds of equity into the business and told us as a management team to crack on with spending it. Um, they will not be funded uh, for that money in its entirety, so that's at risk. Um, and in our board meeting 
Um, so we spend this this year in year year two of our ramp, we'll be spending six hundred and ten million pounds this year. Um, they have already approved a spend of six hundred and twenty for next year, with a view to increasing more again. I can't say any more than that, actually, in terms of they are telling us to crack on with investment. Uh, they've also put five hundred million pounds into reducing debt, so that we're paying less on debt, um, so that we have our leverage is now down to. 70%, which is one of the better ones. Um, Lawrence, does anybody else want to comment on Nick? Um, just um, very, very quickly. I mean, I, I think, I think as Ian's quite right, rightly said, what we're seeing is uh, Macquarie have very, very quickly backed up their promises with money in the bank. So we have all that money. It is transacted. It is part of what we have, and we now have the freedom to invest. So I think from our point of view, operationally, that's been extremely important to see that. Um, but um, uh, we are also conscious, as Macquarie are, that we've got a long way to go to rebuild our reputation and they are seeking to do to do the same. Um, and, and, and it is entirely right that you should hold us to account on that. Um, turning to the uh, planning, planning point, um, we are a statutory consultee to local plans, but we're not a statutory consultee to planning development. And, and that is something that we would like to change. Um, we, we, will, we do plan to be significantly um, harder on our feedback um, because we informally feedback on planning development, particularly around the policy for sustainable drainage. Um, but it is all very well us, us being clear about what is required. Um, what would be very helpful for us is to be working, um, have partnerships with, with councils such that you are able to mandate that level of sustainable drainage through in, into the planning that you are approving. But we are also conscious that that's not an easy thing for you. There is a lot of pressure from government around housing. There is an, all sorts of pressures that you're under as well. Um, but it is an area that we would like to harden the approach up in terms of the policy that new development comes with sustainable drainage and is water efficient. Um, and that is the only that we've got to start somewhere with that standard. Um, otherwise, we will be retrofitting forever. So we entirely support your point. And, and if I could make one final point on that, if we can take the surface water out of the combined sewer system, we create an enormous amount of foul capacity. Um, actually, the foul capacity is not the issue. It's the hydraulic capacity with the rainwater that comes in. So if we can take 40% of the load out, actually, we create the headroom for new development, um, which is quite efficient for everyone without having to spend billions of pounds on retrofitting. So it's a further advantage, actually, in terms of getting that surface water out now from the existing system will help with future growth too. Thank you. Can I just remind councillors that we know that this, these questions are specifically about the presentation, not the themes which we've got coming later, because we know that members of the public have already submitted their questions. And I've said previously, what we're going to do is we're going to get onto our themes, and we all know that our themes are sewage discharge into the sea, leisure, the impact of these on the leisure industry, economic impact, domestic issues, strategic development impact, and Southern Waters future plans. So can I just ask, has any of the councillors wish to ask anything specifically on the presentation we've just seen which is not going to come up later okay i've just got one quick question based on the presentation which is something which was there but you didn't talk about it in any detail at all and i think this is really important for individuals this is 100 liters per day per head per day what is that what does that actually mean to us as people living within our district. Um, am, I, am I best place to pick that one up? Your team favourite topic. Um, yeah, so currently in the UK, um, average consumption per person uh, is about 145 litres per head per day. Uh, in our region, as a result, mostly of compulsory metering, um, consumption dropped by about 16%. So our average immediately prior to COVID was 128 litres per head per day. So in our region, we have people who use water quite wisely. Um, and that compares reasonably with some of the best in Europe. But in other places in Europe, they're already at 100. Um, so consuming, we want to have this target across the whole of society that the average is 100. 
because many, many people need much more than 100 litres per head per day. If you have medical conditions and so on, you must be able to use it. But many people can use less. It's trying to get society to come together to treat water as a precious commodity, to use it in a different way. So it really means things like, um, so for us, we need to improve our leakage performance. We're pretty much towards the front of performance in the industry, um, but we've committed to a 50% reduction in that. Uh, water labelling is one of the things if we're looking at new development. Water labelling, we've brought evidence from Australia that demonstrates that water labelling, water efficient goods, reduce consumption by more than 30%. Singular best contributor to reducing that. So it means things like that. It means things like designing water efficient uh, showers into houses, water efficient toilets, um, lo those type of examples. Does that, does that cover it for you? Yeah, thank you. I just thought it was important that people actually knew it was on a slide, but you didn't actually explain yeah. it. Okay. okay. Yeah, just ask councillors, has anybody done anything specific on the presentation? If not, I'm guessing a lot of the questions from the presentation are going to be covered later. So I'm going to think, do. I think Councillor Cornell would like to speak. Sorry, Chair, to interrupt. No, okay. Chris. Thank you, Chair. I just want to pick up a couple of questions essentially on the Pathfinder project in the Swerp of Catchment. Um, you've obviously identified that of the current Pathfinder's deal is slightly further on. I guess my constituents in the centre of Whitstable would like to have a clearer indication as to what the timeline for any type of consultation on that is going to be and what level of expectation do you think, because obviously you've now got some figures on the table about investment that you'd be seeking to make in this work with catchment and it's uh, investment that you might expect other statutory partners to be doing also. Um, it's useful to hear the comments on misconnections and I know myself and Councillor Baker have kind of commented on this in previous conversations uh, that we've had. So can you give us a clearer idea about where what the Pathfinder timeline for Swerpliff would look like? Uh, and then just a specific question, picking up on uh, Councillor uh, Clark's comment. Um, I have seen evidence recently on planning applications in, in my ward um, to back up Lawrence's assumption that essentially you're becoming more proactive in identifying concerns about sustainable drainage, and that's useful. However, the problem that we obviously have is a large, we have a large proportion of strategic sites which are already in the pipeline. And unless you commented essentially five years ago, we're essentially at stuck. However, those planning applications sometimes fall in and out or they're in a phased development, which means essentially that there are op options. So for us, are you in a position to be very clear as to what you consider to be a sustainable level? We talk about this 100 litres per person per day, which is great, but some of the councils have got 110 litres or they're working towards 150. 50 litres, is for you that 100 litres what we should be seeing in our local plan? Thank you. Um, so Nick, I'll pick up the 100 litres and then you pick up the uh, Pathfinder. No problem. Um, so yeah, I think we have spoken about this uh, previously, Chris. Um, there is no reason why we cannot design to 100. If we're at 110, um, there is no reason we cannot design to 100 um, now. Uh, we would like to see, and we're seeing some developments now, when you look at water neutrality that's now being promoted by Natural England, they're talking about 80 um, litres per head per day. Um, so uh, I, I think we could, uh, and you know, I have said we would. that's what we would like to ask for as the standard. Um, Nick? Yes, Chris, so I can address the time scale. So there's, um, there's uh, four stages to the, the Pathfinder. Stage zero is effectively that study, really understand the water pathways inside that catchment, study the connectivity of all the networks, the surface water, the, the highway drainage in a lot of detail, update our modelling expertise so we understand how that catchment performs across a number of scenarios. So the, the output of that study phase, which is a number of surveys, modelling and desk-based analysis, which in it reinforces in partnership with 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 KCC in particular, uh, Max Tant, someone we can work very closely with to understand that. Um, April will issue that technical report with an aim of, getting, of reviewing that together and, and publishing that and, and having a, a public consultation of that around sort of June, July time. Um, if there's interventions coming out of that initial 
study phase that are no regrets we'll start implementing them as early as march potentially um and then stage st at stage one is those interventions stage two is some the more complex larger scale type activity potentially some larger scale pilots of so something that are relatively new uh, and then stage three is the final where we might require some much uh, more governance around investing um, and until we've really done that study we can't really comment on on the scale of investment but we certainly seen examples where the combination of uh, water company investment and and publicly available grants is about 50 50 for some of these schemes so there's, a, there's a very famous example in white city london where 5,000 uh, people were disconnected from the combined sewer system in a very urban environment with all some of the examples i've talked about swales nature-based solutions so um we've certainly We'll be looking at opportunities to utilise grants where you've got the common benefits of uh, amenity, environmental, uh, air quality, health as well. So that, that hopefully that answers most of your question, Chris. We have set up a forum, a uh, strategic forum, in a, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, which I want to make sure that I've got you invited to. Um, so let me follow up on that action. Thank you. So you've got Councillor Harvey Quirks, happy to speak later. Councillor Kenny. Councillor Dawkins, are your questions going to come up on the themes? Or is it, yeah, thank you. Because we've got Councillor Dance would like to ask something based on the presentation regarding soakaways. So, Mark. Thanks very much, Joe. And thanks for your presentation. I mean, um, my local area is Swellcliffe. So I'm, I'm very pleased with what I hear, not before time. But the issues are the foul water and the stormwater split. And when you look at building regulations, I had a building company and we would be advised we would dig a soak away in the back of someone's garden. But when you're dealing with London clay, it doesn't actually go anywhere. So as it fills up, it overflows, run down the garden into the roads and the drainage network. So somehow we've got to nip this in the bud and rethink the advice Building regulations are giving people with small extensions because add them all up, it is a huge amount of water. So that's my point. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. OK, so what we'd now do is we we'll move on to the questions which have been submitted by the members of the public. So I'd like to ask Andrea to read the questions based around theme one, which is sewage discharge into the sea for general questions. And then what we we'll do once again, go over to members of the council for their questions afterwards. So Andrea, over to yourself, please. OK, thank you. I've got three questions from members of the public on theme one, sewage discharge into the sea. So the first one from Carol Gray is, can you give details to show or show modelling of the extent of the flooding into people's homes that would happen if you didn't discharge into the sea after heavy rainfall? Is there a chart that would show the extent of the backup flooding at certain levels of excess rainfall, or is it an empty threat to justify your pollution? Um, another question from Michelle Jerkin. Why should the community continue to support you or pay water bills when you have complete disregard for the community or the environment through your actions? It's not good enough. And the last question I have is from Mike Slade. Um, apparently, it's against the law to pay someone to remove rubbish if you know they may dump it illegally. Why is Southern Water asking me to break the law? Thank you very much, Andrew. So over to Southern Water, first of all, to respond to those three questions. Um, Toby, would you want to pick up on, um, in terms of, so, that, so there's a phrase that we, we use that uh, what is legal is not acceptable any longer, and that's something that we are trying to be out there with, that storm overflows uh, may be permitted um, via the, the EA licence, but they're just not acceptable uh, in a modern society. So that, that's the pathway that we're following on. So, Toby, would you want to pick up on that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, I mean, it, it, it's not an empty threat. CSOs do form a uh, a relief valve to uh, to stop properties and businesses flooding. And we've got some very specific examples where where that where that has been the case. Uh, I can't produce a you know, a one-off graph because you know this varies from 
um, you know, from catchment to catchment, from community to to communities, the, the, where the onset of that that flooding would occur. But the whole basis, as Ian said, of why uh, this is a permitted uh, system is because the Environment Agency recognised the the benefit that CSOs provide in terms of uh, stopping uh, that that flooding of uh, of housing. Um, but again, as Ian says, what is legal is no longer acceptable, and we recognise that, and that is exactly why you know we put we put the task force and the pathfinders in place. Thank you, Toby. Uh, Nick, was there? I mean, we could probably pick up some of the examples or give some examples of where we have seen some uh, internal flooding, um, and just help with that. I mean, you you would see, I think, perhaps on blockages, how quickly uh, things can back up and flood. Yeah, I was just going to say that we did do a, a study of a different area, um, uh, city of Portsmouth, where if the CSOs were removed, uh, over over two and a half thousand properties were flooded without the use of the storm overflow. So there's certainly uh, examples where uh, we can show that 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 back up. And I did reference the international example, Alexandria, Egypt, and we spoke to earlier where where that's happened too. So um, th there are examples. Okay. Thank you. What about the point, the last question about the legality? So why are members of the public being encouraged to use your system when they believe it's breaking the law by discharging into the sea? Um, so I think it's Toby's picked up that that's part of a permitted system. Um, and, you know, our, the vast majority of what we do is about taking waste out of a system. Um, and where we have a failure, we are fined. Uh, that's how the system works. Uh, so, you know, we do get punished for not complying already. Uh, and that is not money that gets passed back to customers. Uh, and that one particular uh, period when we were not complying, and it was not legal, uh, we were fined a record amount, which again, um, the shareholders have met that cost fully as well. So those are part of the reasons as to why, um, you know, when we get it wrong, we have to meet the consequences and why I think it's fair to say that the service that's provided is legitimately asked to be paid for. Thank you. So there are the questions from the public. Are there any councillors who wish to come in on this? Does it, I've got look at the list, Louise. You wanted to speak. Is this a relevant time for you to come in? Do you believe? Thank you, Thank you Chair. No, some of the um, the concerns that I have from residents are really to do with planning mitigation okay. um, and drainage and things like that. So I'm happy to wait. OK, thank you. Val, is this an opportunity for yourself to come in now to talk about, because I know you're a coastal councillor. Yeah, so yeah, please, yeah. Um, I, I, thank you for all this information. I, I find that nearly an hour into this he meeting, my head is swimming uh, with m information, and I think this is what happens to an awful lot of us. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you opening yourself up to, I hope not a hostile audience, but a fairly searching one. However, the residents of Goral Ward, they have sewage floating through their gardens. They can't use the beaches. Um, our, our fishermen are can't put out to sea. They can't sell their 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 fish, and these the while it's you know I, I heard you talk about optimal performance, significant investment, um, partnerships, sustainability, drainage, but actually, we don't want sewage in the sea. We don't want sewage floating through the back gardens. So can you please actually? try to address um, a, lo a lot of those issues, which I know you have to do by talking about the technology that you are going to use in order to address these things. In um, Specifically, I'd like to ask about the swale cliff number one discharge, because um, it discharged untreated ocean uh, sewage into the ocean at least once every three days, according to figures collected by SOS Whitstable. Exactly a year yesterday, that's 30th of January 2021, the CSO releases ran for over 66 hours. We are told that the CSO system is designed to deal with extreme weather events, and yet the regularity of discharge doesn't support this. So the questions relating to this are, 
Would Southern Water recommend that new house building is stopped until the sewer system is upgraded? We've talked about investment in Swalecliff. Whilst you have increasingly become proactive in responding to consultations on plans within the Swalecliff catchment area, there are many strategic sites in our current pipeline for which there have been no statutory consultations. Would you be willing to provide clear guidance on what level of water efficiency you would like to see set out in new strategic sites within the district or evidence of best practice levels we could seek to reflect in our local plan? Thank you. Thanks, Val. Thank you, Val. I mean, I, I think I've answered the water efficiency. It's 100. Um, there is no reason to ask for anything else. Uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, I've been an engineer for many years. I've lived and worked in many different countries. It's achievable. Um, so I would say 100, and I would ask all councils, all planning departments to be working towards that uh, wherever possible. I think 80 uh, is a stretch, if I'm being honest. Um, that takes very, very specific interventions. So that would be the response on water consumption. Um, Nick, you want to pick up on some of the storm overflows? You're on mute, Nick. <laughs> there we are. I've done that for a while. Um, I, I was going to ask Lawrence maybe to to to, re, to reiterate some of the development um, policy that's in development at the moment. Um, if that's all right, Lawrence, and I can I can chip in on that. Yeah, let me. Could I just address the? I think the really big point that, that, that there's there's two halves to what we have to improve, and um, what we are fully recognising is that our, our our performance in the past has not been good enough. And we are absolutely recognising that and acknowledging that. Um, we, over the last two years, and in particular over the last six months, things have really accelerated. We have made some really significant investments into Swalecliff and are really putting where money where our mouth is, if you excuse, excuse the phrase, by inventing, investing 20, 25 million into Swalecliff to get it back on track. Because we have to sort our own basic performance of our own assets out before we can then have the chance of going to the next level and taking out surface water. So just to give you two, the two hopefully relatively sim sim simple numbers, numbers that um, s signify our ambition here, is that by, by the time we get to the end of 2025, we will have made an 80%, 80% improvement in our own performance. And actually the majority of that would have, would have been done by the end of 2022. Mm -hmm. So we are going hard and fast at getting our own act together to reduce um, times that our system breaks and there is a uh, an overflow or pollution to the environment. So that's one side of this. And then on top of that, you raise the very good, very good point, which comes to us a lot when we talk to members of the public, which is, look, this is happening too frequently now. This is all about e extreme weather should only only be, you know, every now and now and then when, when the problem is, is that climate change has made extreme weather almost a yearly occurrence. And, it, and the fact is, is that extreme weather occurs much more frequently, which means the system is overflowing more frequently. And that the members of the public and our communities have told us that is totally unacceptable. And we entirely buy into that. And that is the reason that we've charged Nick, Nick Mills as part of our team with this task of taking surface water out so that when it when this extreme weather happens more frequently, the sewer system is a bit more resilient and and because the surface water isn't going into it in the first place. So those two sides of our plan, us getting our act together and sorting our own performance out by improving by 80%, and then removing surface water to reduce overflows by a further 80% on top of that are the two big prongs of our attack to support our customers in the community. Thank you, Lance. And I think the other point for me is that we have this quandary of new housing should not be the problem. New housing should actually be taking the problem away. Mm. Um, it's the existing housing that is 80% and it's been designed grossly water inefficient. Uh, and on top of that, we've, we've, we've covered over surfaces, we've made more and more surfaces impermeable, we've not designed porous road systems. You know, for 30 or 40 years, I think we can all be accused of perhaps being asleep in terms of what's been coming at us, it, it's where we're at. So I, for me, I'd like to think that we can get new development because it will actually improve the situation and set benchmarks if it allows us to deal with 
the legacy development at the same time, which has given us a big focus. And then potentially one of the saving graces is if we can get surface water separation, it will help us to deal with it more quickly. So we're trying to give a balance to all of those things if we possibly can. Thank you. Yeah, so I can say from what Lawrence has said, by the end of this year, uh, you're saying there will be a distinct improvement and that the residents here will notice that distinct improvement and we won't be having to close our beaches as often as, as we have done. I think that is exactly what all of our plans are aimed at. But the only point that I would say is that our plans to reduce overflows through surface water, taking the surface water out, that is going to take a little bit longer because we've, we've got all the study work coming um, by springtime, as Nick outlined earlier. And, and I think he also made, um, uh, well, I know because I know he's, he's on the project, but we're also making the commitment that if there are any quick options that we can do to make an immediate impact for the summer, then we will get on with that job. So, what we're saying is with everything that we've done, we should see a really big difference. But just in case that we, we don't, I would also like to be really clear that we are sticking with this. We are not going to move to some other part of the region. We are sticking with you in, in your region and we will see this through through to the end. And there are bound to be a few humps and bumps. I'm sure that that's appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. OK, got questions from Neil. After Neil, it's Chris and then Mel. So, Neil, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, regarding discharge going into the sea, I think we can all agree that what's actually going into the sea and our beaches and our environment um, is bad, clearly. But I want to raise the um, perception of what's going into the sea as well, because I do think that your Beach Boy app, which you've referred to earlier, doesn't actually help anybody. Um, now, what I mean by this, and the question is about modelling, at some point, could we actually have improved modelling? Because Beach Boy seems to be an incredibly blunt instrument in that if a discharge which has you know, under 1% or whatever of actual sewage in it goes out of the longest drop from soil cliff, soil cliff number one, any area that could, in theory, under exact conditions, be impacted. Um, gets flagged for three days on the Beach Boy app saying there's been a discharge, don't use the beach. Um, whereas if it was actual serious pollution from Swap of One, actually landing on a beach, the same notice would go out. Without the modelling and investment in modelling, isn't there a risk that people are just going to assume the beach should always be avoided, as we'll come to later this evening, um, that people will always avoid eating shellfish because if they follow Beach Boys 72 hours after any discharge whatsoever, it's a no-go. So how can you help with this? Is there a way of you improving either the data from your CSO so we know what it is that's actually being discharged, not just volume, but makeup, and modelling so we know that, oh, actually, it's all gone out on the high first high tide, or it's gone towards Herne Bay, or actually, surprisingly, it's the one time in a thousand or whatever where it manages to get to the far side of Whitstable Harbour. Because without that, um, I think we um, are going to struggle, especially as you said, that while we're moving towards um, less reliance on CSO discharges, they're going to be with us for decades still. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Neil. You. I mean, I'll pick up very quickly and then hand over to Nick. Um, Neil, I mean, the, 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 all those points really chime with the points that, that you've raised with us when we've met before. Um, the um, I am... We are entirely in agreement that whilst Beach Boy is extremely well intended, um, it is quite crude in the way, the on-off way that, that it operates. Where we want to move to is more water quality based. Um, however, I am really pleased because when we last met, we, we talked about a water quality monitor and installing that. And we're now in a really good place to install that. So if I could hand over, I won't claim Nick's glory on that, but Nick, if you could maybe talk about the installation of the water quality meter and where we intend to go. Yeah, I'll just cover the Beach Boy point. Uh, completely valid, Neil. And we are we are working on some plans to improve that. So the new version of Beach Boy, which we're hoping to get out this summer, will allow us to understand the tidal conditions and the volume, the duration. So it will be more intelligent to tidal state, uh, actually to your point. And further further improvements we want to make after that to profile what that discharge is and that will probably land in 2023. So yes, completely aware of the binary way 
Beach Boy Works is not ideal, and we've got some plans this summer to improve it. Water Quality Boy that Lawrence has mentioned uh, sounds like you're familiar with. There is a new device on the on the market which allows us to measure uh, coliforms in real time. How good it is, uh, we are uh, confident it will work, but how well it will work is is what we want to test. So we bought two of them. One of the locations we'd like to install it is Tankerton. Uh, I have spoken to uh, Matt about this, and um, we're in agreement we're we're going to give it a good go this 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 summer. So we should better get it in for bathing water season, um, and that will allow us to once calibrated, once 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 tested, we want to be able to display that information uh, in the right format uh, live as well, and that should give us a really good insight on on the bathing water quality. Every every fifteen minutes, the sample will be uh, taken. Yeah, and if I just comment a little bit on that as well, I mean, it, it's really important to get to water quality as a whole. You know, so CSOs are, are one aspect of that, um, and we need to be measuring them properly. There are many other fluxes and flows that will come into waters that will have E. coli uh, elements of. So we're now also trying to look at DNA speciation on E. coli, which will allow us to identify, is it is it human, is it avian, is it bovine? Um, where are the sources that are coming from that we can actually get the proper interpretation of E. coli so that we can take the most appropriate ans uh, action to try to eliminate it getting into the system. Uh, and that's something that Nick, uh, Toby and others have been working on a little bit. And we were discussing with Environment Agency earlier on today as well, trying to bring all of this together into one suite of modelling, Neil, I think, that gives people the right information they're looking for. Because we're, we're totally with you. You don't want to be standing, and I, I live 200 metres from the beach. Um, you want to know what the water quality is more than you want to know whether there's been a spill in the last three days. Uh, and you don't actually know what else has come into the water, and you want to know that as well. So that's what we're all aiming towards, hopefully. Thank you. Chris, next. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on uh, Councillor Becker's point, and uh, it's good to essentially see that there's some progress on the real-time water quality uh, boy in on, on Tankerton. I, I think the key point here, as we've had as a conversation, several points, is essentially you're not going to be able to solve a CSO problem overnight. So the major essential issue is um, how do you essentially answer the question, which is, what are people swimming in rather than necessarily kind of like how regularly are they? So Beach Boy tells us how regularly we have CS out outputs, but the key question that I think we, we all acknowledge we need to look at is particularly how much sewage is essentially in those discharges if we're going to be using it. So it's great that essentially we are going to be collecting information uh, about what the levels are in the uh, in, in the area of Tankerton. But I think that there's still kind of two distinct questions that essentially really need a, a answering. The first is, there is a push from some people to essentially look at citizen science projects at the moment. Um, and I can see people's acknowledgement to that, but in my understanding, they essentially are flawed in two ways. Firstly, they just basically say whether E. coli exists or not, and that doesn't help fishermen in my ward who essentially are battling what is a problem of perception when even themselves, they are putting additional kind of uh, purification techniques in, in order to protect that, to protect their stocks. So purely saying whether E. coli exists or doesn't exist essentially isn't helpful. Secondly, there are more complicated approaches where essentially you can see lab tests, but you need to know where you're creating them. You need to do them regularly. You need to have them uh, kind of like in cool boxes in order to be able to transport it, uh, be transported. And early indications I've seen suggest that that could cost you know something between 60 to 20 k's worth of investment if you wanted to do something across the full year and i don't think it's right for local residents to essentially have to pay that in order to have confidence in where they're going so i guess my key question is essentially what ever, uh, further information could you provide us with on cso sampling so obviously not all cso's essentially have the same overflow as you've suggested 12th if one goes through a uv so whilst actually it might be more regularly used actually i'd expect the proportion of e coli and various things to be reduced so what information do you actually have on cso sampling of the water which comes out 
and could that be made publicly available? So essentially people are at least clearer that if discharges are happening, they've got a clearer idea about how, how diluted essentially the discharge might be. Do we, do we take that one? Yeah, Please, so, so uh, I, I don't know whether we've got samples for all CSOs, but uh, we do have a lot of modeling. So we do have an understanding of where things go uh, and, and, and their impact depending on their location and flow, et cetera. So that certainly could be shared. And I think uh, there is some effort to do that in, in Beach Boy in terms of there's a document that shows how that mapping has been done, but I think it could be expanded. So I'm happy to take an action to, to look at how we could do that. And the sampling, fully accept that the lab analysis is expensive and getting the samples there and the control conditions is complicated there is a new device though that we might want to talk about that our misconnection team is using it's a handheld device that does give an indication of uh, e coli content not just a yes no it's there so that could be something we could share uh, potentially even work with you on i think there'd be a substantive support from SOS Whitstable and other groups looking at community uh, citizen science if that yep. was a possibility and um, but I think any any information I, I'm a bit surprised essentially that you don't regularly sample CSOs I can appreciate that to be honest certain rain you can't consistently say that every time a certain CSO goes the consistency of uh, what essentially comes out of it is consistent. I appreciate that. It depends on how much water is fl uh, flowing through, where it's flowing through from catchment, if there's been agricultural products further up in that pati at particular time. But I think people would expect to have a clear indication about, at least on a monthly basis, on a, you know, it, 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 et cetera, or when they flow. Because as far as I understand, when Beach Boy comes out at the moment, you send an engineer out to essentially check that the data, which is on the Beach Boy system, is accurate. Um, so essentially, are you telling me that those, those engineers, when they're on site, don't collect any information as to what the discharge levels are, uh, so uh, kind of content is? So the, the, en the engineer on site would be if there was a fault of some sort, mm -hmm. but if there's a genuine storm discharge, that, that's, that's not visited in person, uh, from my understanding. There might be some other examples where that is, but on the whole, no, it's done uh, desk-based. Yeah, so I think Nick, Nick, we can, you know, you can surrogate all of that from the sampling that's done in all the treatment works and all the sites in terms of what um, levels of flow we're, we've got, what dry weather flow is coming through, uh, what percentage contents we would generally have in that. Um, there is a safety angle to uh, sampling CSOs during storm conditions as well, which clearly is quite difficult. Um, but let's take that one away and think about, you know, it's part of the modelling of we, you know, we we model the flow through the system. Uh, and we'll model it in terms of dry weather flow. So we have we have the concentrations from assumptions from that. So really all we're saying is, I think what Chris is saying is, if we know the flow conditions at the time, then we can easily, which is what the assumption that goes into the model, we can give a, an approximation. Um, you know, yeah. so, I mean, simple things like some of our works, one of our biggest works at Bud's Farm, I think our dry weather flow is uh, about 350 um, litres per second. Uh, and our storm flow is 4,500 litres per second. So, you know, that will give you some idea of dilution and concentrations, and we, we can estimate on that. that okay, let's just that we, Yeah, let's sort of take, take that away and have a look. Uh, I mean, Chris, when we when we met, met before, you know, I think if I remember correctly, we, we've said that we, we'd be happy to support citizen science. We've got a lot, a lot of time for it. It just needs to be done in a coordinated way so we can all benefit from it. But I think ultimately what, we, what we're trying to do here is really provide something even better, which is real-time water quality monitoring. That, what we're trying to do is almost to go to something better straight away. So we just want to get this device in the water, see how it runs, share those results with you, and let's see how we go. Thanks very much. Thank okay, thank you. Before I go to Mel, one thing I do want to sort of say is we're only on theme one, everybody. I know there's an awful lot of questions here, and... We've been going for an hour and a half, and we're only allowed to go for four hours. So if we continue at this sort of rate, we're going to be very unlikely to get past theme three. And I think there's a lot of stuff which is coming up, which is really, really important, especially when it comes to questions from the public, because these are we are representing the public here, 
and they have got to have their say. So I'm going to hand over to Mel. So just think about that, please. Mel. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. And this is a question from the public, and it's regarding sewage discharge, but it's more focused on the rivers. Um, so let's not forget the rivers and uh, me being a Canterbury councillor, I have a lot of people concerned about that. So a couple sort of, I sandwich a couple of questions all together, but all related. So what levels of sewage is allowed to go into the Stour upstream at Ashford and how often, as we know it does? Also, what, also we want to know what water mon monitoring you are doing across the length of the River Stour from Ashford to Sandwich. Where and how often do you sample and measure and who do you supply results to? And what is your commitment to water quality in the river and what are you doing to improve this? Thank you. Thanks, Mel. One, so one for you or Toby? Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. I mean, river water quality is important to us, is as important to us as sea water quality. It's water quality, full stop. Um, we, in terms of your specific questions, we might have to just go and get some numbers for you to come back more specifically. Um, but um, in terms of the, the main thrust, thrust of, of, of your questions there, um, is the Environment Agency will be monitoring very closely the water quality of the entire river system. That, that's their role, and it's a very important, that's a segregated duty from a water company. Um, and they will set the quality standards for river health, and they will measure our performance, and we also report to the Environment Agency our performance um, in the uh, water that is recycled back into the river system. Um, what is obviously the, the entire overflow agenda that we've been talking through this evening mostly in relation to overflows to the sea, also applies in terms of river systems as well. And so um, the approach that we've been out outlining to you, whilst the pathfinders, it is true, are largely, not wholly, but largely um, uh, aimed at coastal overflows. We do have one which is aimed at internal overflows in, in Hampshire. And we'll be using that information to understand what we would need to do in the upper reaches of the Stour to make the same kind of impact by taking surface water out and removing overflows. But essentially the system operates in exactly the, the, the same way. Um, and obviously the overall governance is through the Environment Agency, which we report to. Thank you. Can so I just ask... If you want to Sorry, can I just interrupt here? Mel, can I ask you to send those questions into either Pippa or Andrew so they can be sent on to Lawrence for more detailed answers so that we can then add those to the minutes after the event? Is that OK with you, Mel? That's perfectly fine, yes. I'll do Thank that. Thank you. Is that obviously something you'll be able to do, Lawrence? Yes? Yeah, sure, no problem. If you don't direct the questions through, through to Barry, he can coordinate to get the right answer from any department um, yep. that needs to be involved. Okay. Uh, and on a, a, a sort of similar vein, in terms of different subject matter, perhaps, but it's the same thing in terms of phosphorus and, and nitrogen um, uh, and the steward, that type of catching, Pevensey levels. We have trial, we've, we, we've made a volunteer um, sort of permit um, assessment of, uh, uh, for P levels, uh, where we've, put, we've actually put drinking water treatment at the back end of our wastewater treatment work. So North and South Hailsham, you know, not quite uh, your area, um, but that's um, producing quite spectacular results if you want to look at it from a, a taking phosphorus out of a system, um, which I think it's coming out once at 0 0.06 milligrams per litre against a previous consent of six or seven, um, and which is good uh, in one way. Uh, one of our vexing questions, though, is that... Um, the carbon footprint of doing so is enormous. Um, so we are using drinking water treatment uh, and we are using a lot of power and a lot of chemicals to achieve that result, which seems somewhat perverse uh, from a, an environmental perspective. On the plus side, given that we're getting the water to that type of quality, we're now starting to look at can we use it in a different way? Um, instead of returning it directly into rivers or streams, can we use it in agri water, for example? Uh, and take the stress off the system from the, the chalk streams that we have. So just hopefully another example of where we are trying to push some boundaries and make some pretty big investments in terms of dealing with what has seen as pollution. Could I just build on that and just make one other just very quick point? Apologies, Joe. I, I know you can't just build on this question, but it's also really important, and this is sometimes unpopular when we say it, but it does need, need to be said. 
is that river water, water, water quality is very materially impacted by agriculture as well, very materially, much more so than a water company. And I say that in the context of we are entirely focused on improving our own performance in relation to river water, but agriculture plays a huge part, you know, in terms of runoff, in terms of agriculture and animals, it plays a huge part. And there is a real danger here, and Toby might want to support this one, that actually, from a public perception, is that the water companies do everything and improve performance and take the surface water out, but river water quality doesn't improve because it is so fundamentally affected by agriculture as well. It's just a contextual point. It's not in any way taken to say that we're not focused on our own activity. Okay. Thank you. We've now got a question from Andrew and then Mark. So, Andrew Cook, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, actually, I've not heard too much about Herne Bay at the moment, so I'm, I'm going to. Um, uh, my, I am actually the uh, Heron Ward Councillor for Herne Bay, and um, as you heard earlier on, I am a beach hut owner. So a lot of the things you said about um, Swellcliff is, is obviously good news for for the people in the association that have their beach huts on the beach. Um, obviously, last year we weren't allowed to go to our beach huts because of pandemic, and this year, or last year, 2021, should I say, we spent most of the time being told we can't go in the water. It felt so, so really, quite frankly. Uh, uh, very pleased to hear that Swellcliff might have a helping hand. However, that's quite a small part in things, really, um, uh, to considering what we've had to suffer. Um, increased pumps, retention tank ponds, um, obviously a separate, uh, separation of rainwater and sewage. I get all this. It's great stuff. But we are looking down a long way down the system for some of this to come forward to help them out. As I'm sure you guys are well aware, that we're the ones that suffered. So uh, hearing from Whitstable about a bit of sewage going through their gardens, for it pumping up through our toilets in our houses in the middle of Herne Bay, um, I don't know what to say really, because this cannot continue. It's not the first time it's happened. I pray it's the last time, but with what I'm listening at the moment, I'm not hearing any particular plan. So I'm not going to ask you to give me a plan tonight, but I am going to ask you to give me a plan of what's going to happen for Herne Bay and a timescale of how this is going to happen. Now, if, if uh, the chair will let me, I'm going to read out one from one of our local residents. I'm not going to go through the barrage of other co conversations that there's been, but this is pretty much uh, a good place to start, really. When and where, and again, I'll, I'll take it in writing later. I don't need it to be replied to tonight because obviously I'm appreciative that we're, we're short on time. But when, and I think Andrea or, or the Democratic crew have got a copy of this email somewhere so they can forward that through you so you can give a full answer to it because the lady does deserve an answer. When and where will Southern Water publish their findings of the investigation into the causes of the properties flooded in Herne Bay, August 2021? We will, for the moment, we won't ask you to go back to the other ones. But that's, that'll do for a start off for this lady. When and where will the outcomes of the independent investigation investigation be published regardless of cause variance my property has been flooded by internal and external drains overflowing three times following the heavy rain what guarantees and actions are southern water taking to ensure the properties are not flooded again now that's that's the question and that can come through from democratics to your good selves and you can answer that one for the lady and obviously i'd be very interested to see the, the reply to that as i'm sure the other committee members would be Really, I mean, I have a choice as a beach hut owner whether I go in the water to swim or not. Living in my house with sewage coming into it, I have no choice. And we should be on a priority list in the centre of Herne Bay for what, how we're going to sort this out. It's, it's critical. And this is not the first time. We had a big session about 10, 11 years ago, and everyone told us it wasn't going to happen again. And it has happened again. And not to not to be to sort of, I'm sure we all understand the, the, the weathers. What happens in Swellcliff? What comes out of Swellcliff comes down to Herne Bay. That's the way that it goes. Okay, that's the way it happens. If you put a load of oranges at Swellcliff, they'll all end up at Herne Bay. So we do get a run raw from from Swellcliff. But at the other side of it, on an incoming tide, Maypole, uh, May Street, uh, and coming out through the Glen there, Bishop Stone Glen. 
Well, we get that as well because that's the one coming in. So the center of Herne Bay, central, gets it from both directions. And I know that my Herne Bay councillors will want to know what's happening up at May, uh, Maypole. They're desperate to know what guarantees they're going to have. So again, I'm not going to ask for anything tonight, but I want you to, to, to actually write and tell us the time scale and what's going to happen so we can see that. Um, I think that's really um, sort of putting Herne Bay on, on, the, on, on the map there, that we do need to be looked after because we have houses that are being having sewage coming through them, which is not acceptable in businesses. I've got other people that have asked me, you know, about compensation, com compensation, all those things. That's a conversation that can happen later on off, off of here once we start, you know, once I get your your plan of strategy of what you're going to do to make sure this doesn't happen to Herne Bay again. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. You. Thank you, Andrew. Can I just say, before I hand to Southern Water, there's also an issue with certain residents in Whitswell, which Val has told us about, who are also having sewage entering their properties. So I think it's really important that you're right, people have a choice to go into the sea, but people don't want raw sewage being pumped back into their homes. So I don't know if there's anything Southern Water can say on that now, but I believe a more detailed response will be needed for this and also a likely time scale of when work is going to be done because you, you're right our weather is changing drastically at the moment and what should have been a once in a lifetime for these residents is now becoming a fairly frequent life experience so i don't know who's going to take it from southern water um i'll i'll pick that up i'll just be very brief and very happy to come back to you specifically um, it is entirely unacceptable, the flooding that occurred. Um, we do need to work um, in partnership with the council, though, because it was a mixture of sort of flooding from the water not being able to get away through gullies and, and, and at the bottom of uh, just before the basement properties. And so there is work for us to do together. Um, but it is entirely unacceptable that that level of flooding occurred. We will provide you with a, uh, a full written response into that and tell you not only what we plan to do, but we are actually what we have already done. Um, and we will, we will pick that up after tonight. Thank you. OK, Mark, next. Thanks, Joe. Um, I, my first job, I trained as a hydrographic surveyor. And I understand Andrew's point, and I understand Val's point, and tidal flow. With our outfalls, they've been out there a number of years. Are they long enough? Are they doing the right job? Certainly issues in Herne Bay years ago were to do with the valves at the end of the outfalls. And where we're actually going to put metering to measure coastal, um, fecal coliforms, etc., are they actually in the tidal flow? So therefore, an independent hydrographic survey, survey on springs and neaps will tell you optimally where to put this metering system so we know exactly what's going on, because if it's slightly north or slightly south, we're not going to get a true reading. Now, if you look at the Thames estuary as a whole, there is millions of tonnes of water that move on a daily basis. And at the interim point, let's just make sure it's nowhere near our beaches. Now, that could be strategically letting the outfalls go on the right time, on the right tide, with the wind in the right direction. There will be optimum ways of getting rid of X amount of effluent, which will be least damaging to the beaches during this interim period because before it's resolved. How do you feel about that? Thank you, Mark. Um, Nick, do you, want, do you want to pick up particularly that tidal flow positioning? Open up with that one. Um, so, yeah, no problem. In terms of the water quality buoy, we're planning to put it within the designated bathing water area. Uh, it needs to be out of the surf zone but close enough to the beach that's representative of where the users will be uh, and also we, we want to use it as a, a comparison with any samples that are taken from the shore so it will be within the designated bathing water area that's that's the discussion i'm having with the foreshore manager at the moment um, okay 
Thank you. Andrew, did you have something you'd like to follow up with on your question? Um, well, it's a bit, it was just a sort of an alongside, which I didn't quite get to on, on, on it, actually, which was, um, I know that some of our councillors are very concerned over um, uh, uh, the fact that Southern Waterway says it has headroom on um, uh, on on the uh, uh, for more houses and things like that, which comes up in the planning. And and obviously, I do believe we probably need our planning system and and, and Southern Water to get their heads around this a bit, because it seems nobody can say no to any houses, even if it's going to create huge problems. And um, and and we have got a lot of houses going in up at. Um, uh, the Reculver end of things, so that's going to be used in the May Street Surrey system. And if they haven't got an additional formats of retention or whatever, or or or, 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 or coping with the sewerage, it looks as if that's going to be coming pouring down through the Bridgestone Glen and out into the sea. In any case, so there's great concern over that. And we don't, and, and we know it's going to be particularly bad when there's a storm situation. Because this is this is so critical. I mean, even today. Uh, as a point, and, and, I, and I get this is not just southern water. We just we do have to get our heads around all of this stuff to work together to to see how it sorts itself out. But today was a quite a high tide. Well, actually, the tide wasn't that high, but there was a strong north wind coming in straight into it on a high tide. Well, we had Kings Road flooded through the drains. It all came back up through the drains. Richmond Street flooded, and I was just waiting to get the calls today to hear that the poor souls in Richmond Street. Had gone down. I haven't had those calls, so I'm hoping they didn't get flooded, because that would have been probably sort of coming back at the plus series and everything, not everything else going through the through the system. But um, we have got real problems here, and I am truly, truly worried for for the centre of Herne Bay. So I could just keep emphasising that point. But we do need to look at this business from the other areas of how we can actually make sure that planning Southern Water actually get this thing together where they. They either say that has to be done to make sure that the water isn't messed up with water quality or alternatively is not going to have to pump everything into the sea as soon as we get a flood. So we do need those things to be happening and working properly. Otherwise, I'm afraid to say it will continue to be as it is. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm going to do is I've just got a couple of points I'd like to make. And then I'm going to say that's the end of theme one. I'm going to suggest we take a break for about five minutes. But having listening to what's been said from your presentation and also the questions from the public and also fellow councillors, there's been a lot of stuff which has been put forward and there's been a lot of answers. But for me, I'm not. I'm a geographer. OK, I'm brutally honest. I'm a geographer and I'm a simple geographer at that. And I believe one of the biggest problems is time lag. Time lag is the time it takes for the water to get from the rain into the system. And I know that there are so many different solutions, which I think is what Nick has talked about in terms of a catchment area, to increase time lag, meaning there's less water getting into the system at a faster rate. But what I also know is that it's not just the responsibility of Southern Water to do that. It is not just the responsibility of a council. Lawrence talked about the guys on the roads. Well, roads, Kent County Council. Yeah, that's over to Mark, who's also a Kent County Councillor as well as a City Councillor. Well, we've talked about all the developers and the plans which they've got, where these things can be designed out. We've talked about people concreting over their driveways, which, lovely, or concreting over their gardens, which leads to increased runoff, gets there. And there are so many things which we can do, or we do without unintended consequences. I believe that the best thing which can come out of tonight, and I'm not talking about specific points, I think we need to have a round table meeting with developers, with planners, with members of the public, everybody there. So we can all talk about not what problems we're creating, but how we need to work together to solve it. I believe we need a holistic approach to this. And I think, sadly, I don't always believe that happens. I believe that it's very easy to blame one part of it without looking at the overall picture. So that's my take on this. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if that's true because I've not taught geography for donkey years. But what I do know is from my basic educational levels, that's what I would like to see happening. And I know having spoken to developers, they've not heard from you, but they want to be involved in this. 
So that's what I'd like to end, say at the end of theme one. I don't know if anybody from Southern Ward would like to take me up on that opportunity. If I if I could pick up on that, we, we run a developers day every single year. Um, so developers are with us um, every year where we do presentations on water efficiency, slowing water down. I'm with you in terms of the whole point is to slow water down. Um, that's really, really important. So we have been working with developers. Um, I would say developers are more interested in working with us now as well and with you um, because we're having some constraint on house. I take Andrew's point of you can't just build any old house. You need to build them properly as well. So I think, yeah, we're all completely agreeing on this. In the National Infrastructure uh, Assessment this morning, it was agreed that water is a system of systems that any geographer will know. Um, but our policy, our planning, uh, how we divide up with independent drainage boards, water utility companies, is not a system of systems as yet. Um, and it's that system of systems that has to be enshrined into the holistic overview that actually we can make this work. So thank you. Uh, we would, you know, we would agree. I'm a civil engineer and environmental engineer. I would agree with you. Um, it's not new. There's always stuff that's been done elsewhere in the world. It's 35 years since we wrote Making Space for Water. Um, so I think we've got plenty we can go at. What I will say before I say we're going to take a five minute break is in my notes, more the questions and your answers. I've got holistic written down eight times. Good. And I think that's what we need to do. And I do believe that that is something great to have a meeting with you and developers, but it's not got the other parties. It's just two tiny bits of a jigsaw. And without everybody involved sitting down together, people don't see how their impacts, developers don't necessarily see their impacts on other people. So I think it's important to get all of the stakeholders together at the same time. But okay. so if, I, if I could suggest the Pathfinder projects are doing exactly that. They are bringing the bodies together that are responsible for water. In some places, that's up to a dozen organisations who have responsible responsibility for water management, which could be rivers trusts, wildlife trusts, councils, highways department, independent drainage boards, ourselves, developers, um, all need to come together and look at it. So we're, we are with you. We will use the Pathfinders to help inform some of this discussion going forward as well. Thank you very much. It's now 7.18. What I'm going to suggest is we break for five minutes and then come back at 23 minutes past where we will move on to theme two, which is the impact on leisure and theme three, economic impacts, followed by four domestic issues, strategic development, then future plans, and then miscellaneous. Okay, so five minutes, and I'll see you all at 23 minutes past when we start again. So thank you, everybody.
Thanks very much, Vanessa. Okay, so we now move on to the second part of the meeting. So, Sorry, Chair. It might just be worth making sure everybody's back before we that's continue. What I, was going to ask for. I was going to ask for another roll call so we can actually see everybody's come back. So is that possible, Pippa? Or Yeah, just one moment, because it doesn't look like Andrea's back. So let me just get the roll call up. OK, thank you. Oh, Andrew, back. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, I said, can we have another roll call just to make sure everybody's back? <laughs> yes, certainly, Chair. Thank you. Um, sorry. Right. Um, Councillor Baker. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clark. Present. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Present. Thank you. Councillor Cornell. Present. Thank you. Councillor Dance. Present. Thank you. Councillor Dawkins. Present. Thank you. Councillor Decker. Present. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Harvey Quirk. I'm here, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor House. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kenny. Present. Thank you. Councillor Maslin. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Sol. Present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. So we now move on to theme two, which is the impact on our on leisure along our coastal strip. We have no questions being submitted in advance of this topic. So can I open up to committee members to ask them if they have any questions related to the impact on leisure? I know we've covered a lot of that already by looking at swimming and so forth. But I see Chris, then Mel, then Val. So Chris, over to you first, please. A very practical question. Um, I've been asked by a series of sea swimmers in Whitstable just to ask a question about Beach Boy and essentially how it operates. So a large number of uh, swimmers in our area obviously use Beach Boy in order to make a decision as to where to swim on the coast and more importantly, uh, how confident they are in using it. But if I identify that Beach Boy basically only records or submits new information on CSOs every two hours as a data dump, they've asked the question, is it possible for Beach Boy to present, uh, update itself on a more regular basis so that they have real-time information rather than find themselves in the uh, see at half past eight, only to find out that there was a release at eight o'clock. It's just been, in, uh, they just only know about it at 10 o'clock. Uh, probably, probably my question uh, to answer. Yes, certainly that's our, uh, that's what we want to move to. It's likely to be something uh, that the rest of the industry will be asked to do every hour. So we, we are expecting to get that faster. There are some IT challenges. Um, which we're working through at the moment on how we can do that. Thank you. Would you be able to let us know when this is going live? In, obviously not now, but so we can start promoting it as well for our sea yes. users. Uh, ba Barry has a uh, Beach Boy uh, steering group, um, which I, I, I would normally attend and help chair. Um, the next one of those, Barry, is the 14th. 14th, correct, yes. So I think we just need to make sure we've got someone represented it there and then we can talk about those plans. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Mel next. OK, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, again, this is uh, relating to the rivers. Um, a lot of people like to use the river to swim as, and canoe and all sorts of things. So I'm not sure what you have available to alert people to pollution in the river that happens quite a lot along Fordwich. So a lot a lot of people want to know what when pollution's occurred along there, if there's anything in place. Uh, picking this one up if you wish. Go Barry, I'll, I'll top and tail it. Thank you. Um, we are looking at bringing inland waterways into Beach Boy uh, to actually mirror what's going on with spill releases into the sea we want to do the same in rivers currently there's only a couple of rivers in the uk that have bathing water status and they're monitored by the ea we need to bring that in we're looking at piloting a couple of rivers in sussex 
to, to accelerate those plans. Obviously, that's not discounting anywhere else, but but we need to understand how we bring that how we bring that change about effectively. It's going to be uh, closely working with local authority in the EA just to make sure we're doing the right things in regards to testing and and how we significantly do that. Nick, does that does that tally with your thoughts or anything you'd like to add to that? I think what Barry's referring to there is designated inland bathing waters when there are very few examples at the moment, but I expect that to change. But in terms of monitoring, uh, we will we are looking at testing a couple of locations this year to have inland locations on Beach Boy to see how that goes. It is a slightly different ask uh, with the expectation that we will roll that out further over the right time once we've learned from this year. So uh, some locations this year, more more to come. Thank you. Can I put a request in? If you are looking for rivers, the Stour, being such a unique ecosystem, would be a lovely one to look at because of the chalk stream nature. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Joe, that would be my my top ask as well. Yeah, and I think Joe and Mel, I think you know, I think as as, as we've said, um, the storm overflows are are but a percentage of the uh, the pollution. Um, so actually what we'd really like to get to is water quality monitoring in the rivers. And I think that's going to become a theme from the Environmental Audit Committee outcome. Um, so we will be pushing and are lobbying for that as well, that we try to move all these things towards real-time water quality monitoring. Thank you. We've got Val next and then Louise. Yeah, thank you. I'm returning slightly to a theme that I came up earlier. I mean, I look at all your proposals, um, your sustainability, water efficiency, all these words, significant um, investment. And yet we are a town just, just, just recovering from pandemic. Many businesses have suffered very badly and are hanging, just hanging on. And we therefore rely on our tourists who come here because to Whitstable because of the water sports and the swimming. And it's a very attractive place for, for all those things. And yet for many days this year, the beaches had to be closed. The tourists didn't come. The businesses are suffering. I, I would like um, you said I, one of you said that by the end of 2022, that this problem would be uh, better than it is now. So I would like your assurance that by the end of this summer, we haven't got the same issue. Thank you. Thank you, Val. I don't know who's going to pick that up from Southern Water. Well, I'll, I mean, I'm, I'm not picking up. Um, uh, I mean, I think, Councillor Kenny, we have uh, we have given that assurance. Uh, uh, Lawrence gave that assurance earlier. Um, I mean, I've spoken to Visit Kent fairly recently uh, on one of the uh, one of the things that I was talking to them about was the importance of uh, us all, uh, you know, getting behind and uh, promoting uh, what is a fantastic destination. I think one of the parts, one of the crucial parts that we've got to play in that is in exactly the type of real-time monitoring that uh, Nick has been describing, which will be so important in um, uh, creating uh, greater greater confidence. Thanks, Joan. Thank you, Louise. Yeah, thank you. It's really just to, to touch upon um, what Mel said. I don't want to go off tack. I know that uh, lots of councillors here want to talk about the, the coastal issues, but um, there's a very successful business in Sturry called Canoe Wild, and they use the Stour all the way up to Grey Ferry. It's a very busy stretch of water. Um, so really, I just kind of wanted to echo what, what Mel said, um, and I kind of really want assurances from Southern Water as they are located in Surrey along that stretch. I really want assurances from Southern Water so that I can go back to my residents and say that you are keeping the waters as clean as you possibly can be on this stretch so that residents of Surrey, Fordwich and all the way through to Grey Ferry are safe when they're using the river. Thank you. So again, I'll refer you refer you back to uh, you know an answer Lawrence Lawrence gave earlier about the you know our commitment to uh, you know maintaining the quality of our inland waters as much as the quality of our 
uh, of our coasts and beaches. Uh, you know, we do that within the, uh, you know, in the constraints of the environment agency, uh, environment agency set. Um, you know, we are but one contributor to the, uh, you know, the, the, the nutrients, uh, the, the bacteria that we find in, find in rivers. But I can give you our absolute assurance that we will continue to strive to uh, improve our contribution or reduce our contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I've got. Oh, just, sorry, Joe. I was just going to say. I think oh, the, other thing, the other thing that we have said we will do as well, Louise, is we will actively try to measure all sources. Um, you know, so at Chichester Harbour, um, which is one we might, you know, it might be useful, Toby, not for tonight, um, but actually sharing with, with the councillors in terms of what we're doing there, bring everyone together to get measurement of all influent uh, polluting loads, so that we can actually identify where the best interactions can be made. Can I just come back on that? Is that okay? You mentioned that you were going to um, trial the uh, Beach Boy app in um, in busier areas of inland water, such as the Stour. Um, I'd be delighted to have a conversation with you if you wanted to use Fordwich and that, that stretch of river. So if you wanted to have a chat outside of the meeting, I'd be delighted to do that. Yep. Thank you, Louise. Put me down to follow up. That's fine. Yep. I'm going to come in. I'm going to be really cheeky now. I live in Herden Bay, as do quite a few of the councils around the table. And we're a seaside, traditional seaside town, which has grown up around the leisure industry. We know that with the increase in staycations, people want to come to various towns on the coast for different activities. If our leisure is blighted because of what's happened with our water quality, we are not going to get the number of tourists which we'd hope to get. It's all well and good, Toby, that you've talked about working with Visit Kent and so on, but the damage has been done. People see it nationally that this is happening. So how are you going to help us promote our coastal leisure towns? What can you do to support it? Otherwise, it's going to be so damaging to our local economies. And as we've seen with a recent Critability report, low coastal towns are reliant upon seasonal industry. And if the seasonal industries die because our leisure industry is decimated by something which is out of our control, the town dies. So what can you do to help us and to support us? So I absolutely, uh, absolutely get what you're saying, uh, saying Joe. Um, uh, I mean, of course, uh, the, you know, the thing that we can do is going to make the most most difference is to continue to improve our performance, address the address the, the issue of CSOs that we've we've talked about, uh, and continue to invest in our in our assets so that you know people can see uh, you know see the uh, see the benefit of the investment that's going in. Uh, and then I think, as Nick referred to earlier, uh, you know that that real time monitoring, so that you know people um, you know, people understand and can see, uh, you know, actually what is what is happening in the uh, in the coastal and, and and if necessarily in river river habitats as well. Uh, and then you know um, point people towards, for example, uh, you know the environment agencies. Uh, uh, bathing water monitoring statistics, which are you know year on year improving, uh, they've improved again again this year. You know these are you know real evidence that actually you know Kent is a is a great place to to visit. Thank you. We've got Andrew and then Chris, and then what we do is we move on to theme three, the economic impacts. So Andrew first. Uh, well, yes, Joe, I wanted to echo what you were saying there, um, because, uh, I mean, obviously, as you know, I operate the the pier, on the pier and what have you. And, of course, the big thing was for this year is people were coming to us and had no idea what they were coming to. But when they touched down here, they soon got to hear about it because it was all over the place. You couldn't help but pick up a newspaper talking about it, all in the peak season. So I'm truly worried that a lot of people that would be repeat people coming back to us, we've now lost. So I actually would like to see some additional assistance for the centre of Herne Bay to draw the, the people back in that we've probably lost because of all the bad publicity through last year. Simultaneously, of course, 
I want to see a year next year where we don't have the problems we had this year, because otherwise we'll be back here. So you better support us some more for the following year. So we need to crack the problem. I agree with you guys totally, Toby. What you just said, hundred percent right. The best thing is clean your clean your act up. Let's get this right. However, I feel we've already been damaged now because of the people down that came through last year, and we had a lot of people here last year, and all everyone was talking about was blooming sewage, not how nice the ice creams were. Thank you, Andrew. I don't know if anybody's going to pick that up from Southern Water. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have conversations outside of this meeting with, uh, with, with anyone about how we, how we work together to, uh, you know, promote the, promote the fantastic coast and what we're doing to contribute, uh, contribute to that. I mean, I'm sure you've got lots of plans for uh, promoting the. Uh, you know you, 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 the towns and beaches along the along the coast, and we'd be we'd be very happy to participate in that. Joe, if I may, could just quickly come back there. I mean, to be honest with you, um, Toby, pleased to hear you say that, and I totally agree. Outside this meeting, far the best place for us to have a conversation. Um, and obviously, uh, um, you need to win some good support back from the people because you've got a lot of people not wanting to pay their water bills at the moment. So we do need to put a positive side to Southern Water. But I will, we'll carry on that a bit later on. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, Chris. Um, well, if, I, if I may, to Andrew, oh, yeah. this is the point we're raising about with much more intense rainfall in the summertime. Our concern is that storm overflows will operate more in the summertime. Um, if they are consented in the system, uh, one of our concerns is how can you help us to make the case, building all of this together, that makes a compelling case for putting more and more investment into things like surface water separation and additional storage at the same time to get things moving quicker because if we don't do that i worry that this will stretch out for 20 or more years and, and i frankly I, I don't think it's necessary to do that um and i think there are better solutions if we work together on this we can make a more compelling case so we would invite you into uh, what we are doing with our business plan submission which we have to submit next year um, for why we should be investing more in infrastructure and also that very difficult area of where it is multilateral funding, as I've spoken to Chris and others about, of where we have to bring different entities together to achieve an outcome that has big economic benefit. So, for example, when we uh, first put the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive and 20 years ago when you couldn't swim in any of the seas because we were the dirty man of Europe and we've progressively improved, we know that's a £1.2 billion a year coming into the local economy. So the investment has been worth it. And we'd like to work with you to try and make those cases for better investment, more focused investment, to, to make sure that these things don't happen. Thank you. Chris? I just wanted to ask a very specific question about blue flag beaches. Um, obviously, the information generally presented by the Environment Agency talks about water quality improving. And once a year, we have a decision about whether we go for a blue flag beach. Now, we use that as part of an attempt to bring tourists to the area. But I think there needs to be acknowledgement that blue flag beaches doesn't mean that there is no urban wastewater or sewage related discharge. It just predominantly relates to the fact that um, that discharge, which happens, is documented. And essentially, the council has enough uh, confidence that essentially that that is presented in a clear and accurate way to members of the public. So I think we've talked about this before, but I'm just seeking to essentially get your, your, your commitment. It strikes me that when we do an application next year, one of the challenges for local authority is that we might have considerably more data as to the quality of, uh, of water quality. You know, for example, putting the water quality buoy in the, in the sea will give us considerably more information. So can we get a commitment to both having that information about the modelling of each CSO and essentially how it operates, both currently and on an ongoing basis, so that we can make a decision as an authority as to how sensible it is to continue with the Blue Flag Beach approach. Nick, is that for you? Yeah, that's fine. We can follow that up. up. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. OK, now we're going to move on to theme three, which is the economic impacts. So I'm going to ask Andrea to read the questions which have been submitted on this theme from the general public, please. Thank you, Director. Um, 
There are quite a few questions. They're only from two uh, sources, so I'll go through them slowly. So the first set is from James Green. Um, in late June, we had reports of our oysters being associated with norovirus instances, which on investigation coincided with Southern Water's use of combined sewer overflows in the area. It took Southern Water until September to respond to our inquiries about this event. There seems to be very little to no engagement with our industry over spill events. And until there are inf infrastructure improvements, this is essential. Can Southern Water assure me that they will respond to inquiries promptly and enter into dialogue with us regarding these events and hopefully any infrastructure improvements that may be on the horizon? Uh, James's second question is, the shellfish industry in the area has been heavily affected by the use of combined sewer overflows by Southern Water over the last year, and still is, and none more so than the oyster industry where the product has to be eaten raw, and so the end consumer is more susceptible to the effects of this kind of pollution from pathogens such as E. coli, and more so norovirus. In May and June, we had sales of Whitstable oysters of over £100,000 per month, both domestically and internationally, including Hong Kong. After the first spill event at the end of June, for the next three months, we had to close to zero sales, as each time we tried to reopen, there was another spill event and associated cases of norovirus. We employ up to 12 people on the farm directly, and many more are dependent on the supply of Whitstable oysters. How is Southern Water going to compensate both the industry and the people who may lose their jobs if their use of combined sewer overflows continues on a regular basis due to a lack of infrastructure investment. For your information, the market in Hong Kong has still not opened up again for us due to the Hong Kong authorities' concerns over food safety, and there is no likelihood in the near future. This market alone was worth £30,000 a month to us. And James's final question is, there are many outfalls in the area of our production site that are not monitored, so we cannot access information online regarding their use by Southern Water or what the quality of the effluent from these is. Can Southern Water enter into an agreement to monitor these more closely and to sample the effluent to make sure they are not contaminated with sewage? And the other... Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. I've yeah, got more take, questions. Yeah, we've got just, another set of questions which Andrew's going to take read out from the Whitsmore Fishermen's Association and then yeah. we'll take both of the general public questions together. Okay, thanks Andrew. So I'll continue, yeah? Yes, from please. Whitsmore Fishermen's Association, sent from Cardium Shellfish Limited, these are. Um, does Southern Water accept that they have created huge problems for the local fishing industry? Does Southern Water understand that their total lack of, du of duty and care towards the oyster industry could cause serious illness or worse? Shellfish harvesters in Whitstable have been forced to depurate seawater due to contamination. The Whitstable Fishermen's Association has been told by the Environment Agency that there is moderate contamination in the harbour from the Goral Stream outlet. Whitstable fishermen have also noticed an exponential and unseasonal growth of seaweed. Is Southern Water testing every outfall, including surface water, for all contaminants? Is Southern Water aware they have destroyed our local shellfish and fish markets and the long-standing internationally renowned reputation which still has for its seafood? Is Southern Water willing to engage with the fishing industry in mitigation and also improve the communication with the local fishing industry? And do Southern Water acknowledge the sheer devastation and distrust the discharges are causing to the whole catching and retailing sectors of the shellfish industry through undermining consumer confidence? Thank you very much, Andrea. So, we will ask Southern Water now to respond to those, and then we've got a couple of questions from councillors. Yeah, I'll, ha I'll, I'll have a first bash at these, uh, at these Joe. Um, I'll try and deal with each of them in, uh, in sequence, but some, some of my answers will, will overlap. So on, on the first question from James, uh, that, that is a simple answer that is yes. Uh, the, 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 second, the second question uh, is, a, is a more complicated one uh, and runs into uh, question three as well. So the, 
as we've already discussed, the um, the sources of um, bacteria getting into the sea are uh, are many and varied. Um, you know, they're not simply from um, you know CSOs or from uh, our, our discharges. And I've already referred to at Swellcliff, some of those have UV treatment on uh, on anyway. Um, part of part of what uh, what we've discussed doing with uh, with Nick and the task force is looking, as Ian described earlier, at the um, uh, the DNA speciation of bacteria to uh, to specifically identify uh, where where that bacteria is uh, is coming from, um, and and until you know that is. Uh, um, online, uh, it is it is nigh on uh, impossible to identify the source of bacteria that may, that may be contaminating uh, contaminating seafood. Um, the uh, the reference to um, uh, monitoring um, all uh, all outfalls more, more closely. Well, again, as Nick referred to earlier, we already have um, uh, we have monitors on ninety eight percent of our uh, of our outfalls. Uh, not all not all outfalls that discharge to sea are ones that are uh, operated by Southern Water. So I have a I have a suspicion in that question that these are uh, these are outfalls that um, uh, that don't. Uh, that not not ones that we that we operate. Uh, they may be they may be council ones. They may be other uh, other other operators. Um, uh, again, as I think Nick referred to, uh, we will have a hundred percent coverage on uh, on our outfalls um, uh, within this uh, investment period. Um, uh, do we accept that we have created huge problems for the? For the local fishing industry, well, clearly there is a there is an issue of confidence in the in the local fishing industry, um, uh, and until we have been able to identify, uh, you know, what the what the sources are of um, uh, bacteria that are getting into uh, getting into the sea sea fisheries, then you know we won't be able to uh, best identify what the uh, what the route to to the solution is, and as I say, that will that will come through uh, the DNA speciation work that we've uh, we've already um, referred to. Uh, and yes, we do take our responsibilities seriously. That's why you know we're we're investigating and investing in the the, the DNA technology. It's why referring on to the the next question on. Uh, the Goral Stream outlet. Uh, we're we're investigating that that now. Uh, the misconnections team will be going in there to see if there's any uh, any misconnections into that um, uh, into that outlet. Uh, question four, five, and six. Uh, very very happy to work more closely with the with the industry. Um, you know, as we we referred to earlier. If there are opportunities to promote, uh, then we're we're very happy to uh, to get involved in that. Um, and particularly questions of a technical nature, I think Matthew's on the Matthew Young's on the on the call here. But Matthew will be chairing a um, uh, a technical forum, uh, convening a technical forum that will include uh, Southern Water and the Environment Agency, and we will be able to. Um, you know, be uh, be questioned. Uh, we'll be uh, able to answer. You know, these these technical technical questions uh, much more closely with uh, with those uh, those involved. Thank you, so Toby. I think, I think that's just... probably those questions. Thank you. If Louise and Chris don't mind, I'd just like to ask something based on what you've said. Um, Obviously, these issues are really important to the fishing industry. And it seems from the, okay, I'm being brutally honest, it seems from the questions which have been asked that these problems have been ongoing for a while here. And they're basically asking, not why, but why are they not always fully informed about what's going on? And it's that whole communication side, isn't it? And all, one of the underlying things from tonight is, with this is the information we've got now, and it's going to get better in the future. But my concern is 
we don't know how long that's going to be in the future. It could be this week, it could be next week. But it's for communication. How can we ensure that the fishermen and those involved in the fishing industry or the leisure industry in our towns are informed as soon as these things happened? What's your communication strategy? Well, I think uh, uh, so. Two. Uh, I mean, first of all, you're absolutely you're absolutely right, right Joe. Uh, I think there's two the, the two main main strands to it. Um, one one is uh, through the estimable uh, Mr. Woodham uh, and the, uh, the the bathing water uh, the bathing water steering group uh, and uh, using Beach Boy uh, and really rapid rapid communication there. The other is through the uh, is through the forum that uh, uh, that Matthew will be chairing uh, and using that as a mechanism to. Um, uh, you know, answer uh, answer questions. But if there are, uh, you know, if you've got uh, anyone here has got a, you know, advice on, you know, how better we can we can do that. Uh, I would really really welcome uh, welcome hearing that advice because, um, you know, uh, as the as the um, uh, as the, the the questions reveal, there is a. Uh, there is a lack of confidence, uh, and, and we want to try and, you know, break that down and over, overcome it. Thank you. I think it's lack of that, but there's also the communication side to these key stakeholders. I think, as we see from James Green's question, contacted in June, didn't hear until September. So that's a really important time for them. So I think that's something which has to improve. OK, so... Louise. Joe, could, I, could I make a very quick comment on that? Of yeah, I agree you know. entirely. It's going to be a great opportunity for us to invite members or a member of the fishing community onto the technical group for that valid input. They give really good local knowledge. I think the points that James was referring to was potentially uh, information was requested on as an EIR, which is an in environmental information request, which is it's, it's quite a lengthy process and it takes between 20 and 40 days to gather that information that's potentially potentially the question he was asking there about the delay in that um in in that information which is unfortunately set by the information's commissioner's office and is beyond our control but i fully accept there's a need for readily available information to go to these groups and it's part of my role to ensure i build that i build those relationships and as toby said it's about rebuilding confidence and trust and we, we have to work towards that common goal it's going to be important we're working with the ea next week to actually investigate the Goral tank and the Goral stream. They really, they're really keen to understand. They want to understand how that connects in our network and how it connects into Whitstable Harbour. And are there things happening potentially with, with misconnections into the harbour that we don't know about, but we need to know about quickly. So there is, there, there is work here. It's, it, we, we need to do it quickly, but we will make sure that communication's improved. You have my assurance of that. Thank you very much, because I think that's vital. We've got Louise. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so the I've kind of got two questions really. One one of which has been brought to me by a resident um, that refers to um, external drainage in Surrey, uh, more specifically on Surrey Hill and also some in Bordeaux. Certainly as a councillor, I seem to be reporting these on a regular basis. And something that we've noticed in Surrey is there's an awful lot of road closures on the Shallock Road, which for the businesses in Bordeaux at Goose Farm, it's it's not very good. Um, it makes them difficult to access. So I would like to know what plans you have to address the aging infrastructure in, in Surrey specifically, um, do you have any plans to, to clean that out? If so, um, when, please? Thank you. Um, I think we might have to come back to you directly yeah. on the specific nature of that, that inquiry. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay, Louise? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, I know that... Uh... Rosie Duffield met with the Whistle Fisherman and Chris Attenborough on Friday to talk about some of these things. And so it, it's good to see that the concerns about the Environment Agency about leaking from Girls Stream into Whistle Hub have been picked up. Just um, a, a couple of very specific questions and perhaps a qu question on a commitment. Uh, firstly, obviously, the key to this is the DNA specification. Uh, I, you know, I mean, essentially, 
we were either very unlucky that the concerns around oy uh, about oysters kind of came at the same time as uh, a series of outflows, or there is a link uh, between the two. Whatever happens, there is definitely an opinion in the minds of, uh, of people that essentially that needs to be done, or, or that was the key. So the key question is, when is that DNA, DNA specification going to be available? How widely is that information going to be uh, uh, shared, both with the shellfish community and the wider public? And then can we get a commitment to essentially have a member of a Whitstable Fisheries Association on the stakeholder group which exists uh, within um, in the local area? I don't think that that area necessarily includes the, shell, the two shellfish providers in the area, but to be honest, there's only two of them, and I equally think that we should be inviting them. Um, I think that's the solution to your uh, to the problem. So the the quick answer, Chris, to your last question is: I think yes, uh, we 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 will invite a, a, a shellfishman onto that uh, onto that group. Um, the answer to your first question is that the. Uh, the technology to do the DNA speciation exists. Um, what we need to do is to do it in tandem with the deployment of the uh, the E. coli monitors that Nick, uh, or the, the real-time monitors that Nick referred to, so that we can uh, marry up the uh, the data from both. So that will uh, that will happen during this uh, uh, during this this spring, Chris. Can I separately just get? then a confirmation from one of you who might attend a meeting with the Fisheries uh, Association to particularly discuss that point in the next month or so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Rich, yep. I will, um, I will, I will, I, I will carry that out, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. I think it's really important that these partnerships are developed. You're right that we know people in our district in the same way that you know people on a perhaps much wider scale and i think connecting people will have to be the way we go because that's the only way we're going to solve these problems because we're not just talking about the coast we're not talking about canterbury district we're talking about a much much wider area okay so if there are no further questions on economic impact we will move to theme four which are the domestic issues Sorry, sorry, Chair. Councillor Dawkins has just sorry. come in with a question, I okay. think. Mel. Yeah, thank you. It's just on the economy and um, on um, obviously a lot of um, businesses have taken a financial hit um, due to the sewage leakages, especially fisheries and stuff. Um, but uh, as far as on web, some of the water is still pay, paying themselves bonuses. Do you think you might um, step back from bonuses for the next couple of years until? there's a huge, a big impact that we can see and businesses have got their livelihoods back. I think there's a lot of anger. Thank you, Mel. I guess that's likely to be answered by Ian. Yeah, so I'll pick up. I mean, the bonus metrics for any of these organisations are across a wide spread. Um, so, for example, bringing a billion pounds of new equity into the business as well. Uh, leakage reduction, performance reduction in other areas, compliance improvements. Uh, we have a basket of metrics which are around about customer service, all these type of things. So all of our stuff is done openly. Uh, it's very clearly identified in our uh, annual reports as well. Uh, and they are set and, and measured uh, by our REMCO and our audit committee uh, and our regulators as well. So it, it goes across all of them. And we try to be fair. Um, well, that's uh, we try to look at in terms of how we base our salaries um, and make sure that we are paying in accordance with how the industries work. Okay, just to follow up on that. I believe um, the Maguire Group took uh, one um, one hundred and forty four million pounds profit last year for the Green Investment Bank. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not. Okay, well, there's going to be a profit margin that's made, so. Through the, through the uh, we, are, we are investing more than we're bringing in, as you said, and, and that's what Macquarie's have committed to and not taking um, a, a dividend return. And we have not paid a dividend return in that period. And it's okay, likely well, that our bills will also fall uh, in real terms next year as well. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye on that. 
<laughs> Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Ian. Okay, hand over to Andrea now, who's got a series of questions on domestic issues from the public. And then we've yep. got the councillors after that. Andrea. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, um, from Mark Stiles, this one. During COVID, we had seven water engineers out three times because our drains backed up into our downstairs toilet and shower room. The problem is roots growing in the sewer serving the houses in our road. The sewer runs through a field behind our houses. The neighbours on either side of us had similar problems. The blockage was in line with our houses. We have a combined rainwater and foul water sewer. We were told that it was serious enough for Southern Water to send out a team to scour the drain and remove the roots. Nothing has been heard since, despite promises. The wider issue here is that the sewer is very old and clearly in need of some sort of maintenance or replacement. What is Southern Water doing to ensure that the sewer system locally is proactively maintained to prevent problems? We are dreading what happens when the debris from the sewer builds up again around the roots and we flood again. And the next question is from a Shalmsford Street resident. Since 1973, when we moved here and new drains had just replaced the cesspits, we have endured many, many problems with sewage, including the shared drain at the bottom of our garden frequently overflowing due, due to the cracked drain in the playing field at the bottom of the street behind our house. And I really do mean frequent. Just before Christmas, we had sewage bubbling up in the road outside our house and the road was closed for four days. This is a never ending problem and they want to build more houses. We had so many sewage problems with the field and our shared pipes back in the 90s that we eventually, along with two other properties, had our drains replaced under insurance as the sinking ground had broken the pipes. The road pipes are apparently parallel to the field pipes, so we are told. A complex and badly built system. Thank you. There was one other question, but it was from Jacqueline Hall, and I believe Councillor Cook has already asked it. It was about uh, publishing the findings of the investigation into the causes of properties flooding in Herne Bay in August 21. So I think it's been covered. OK, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Andrea. So we've got some specifics now about people who are living in the rural areas who are suffering problems. So I don't know who's going to pick up, pick that up. That would be me. Oh, thank you, Lauren. Um, so, I mean, firstly, um, can we please have, if it's possible, the addresses and the specifics, and then we can contact those customers directly and make sure that we have dealt with whatever needs resolving. So if offline, if we could have those details, and obviously we'll need the customer's permission um, to have those details from you. So if we could have that, that'd be great. Um, secondly, um, our, our policy is always to go on root cut whenever we find roots as the cause of a blockage. And then our policy is also to put a liner on that on that area of, of sewer pipe, which rehabilitates the sewer system back to the standard that it should, it should be in and stops the roots from coming back in again. That's our standard policy. Um, if we've got the details on the specifics on that, I'll look into why that has or hasn't been implemented on this specific circumstance or brought back. Um, in general terms, I mean, we are, you know, I mean, as you can appreciate, the sewer system is built up over a century. Um, so there are all sorts of difficult bits in relation to how, how the sewer system works. Um, the, the major development in, uh, in, in terms of um, technology that we are installing this summer is to install uh, across the whole region um, 22,000 sensors, which we're going to put in manholes. Um, and those, those sensors are going to tell us where we have blockages that are starting to form in the sewer system, and then we can attend to those blockages, make sure that that blockage is, is fixed and doesn't flood or air a customer's house or pollute the environment. And those blockages are always wet wipes. They're all the things that we'd love customers not to flush down the toilet. But despite a decade of, pub, of activity on that, um, it is still prevalent for people to be flushing wet wipes down the toilet. They are not flushable. Um, so, um, these new new sensors that will be fully installed by the end of the summertime um, will detect where these blockages are and enable us to more proactively fix them. Um, so that that is the sort of major investment that we're making right across the region, and that that will of course be in in your area as well. Thank you, Andrea. Will you be able to check with the members of the public who submitted questions to get their consent to provide? Southern Water with their details. 
Yeah, something. certainly, Chair. Yeah, we'll get in contact with them and, and find out if they're happy for us to do that and then pass them on if so. Yeah. Thank you. That'd be great because then, then we can actually fix it for them. That'd be super. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Got a series of questions from councillors. We've got Mike followed by Louise and then Chris. So, Mike, first. Thank, thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you, Southern Water, for, for being here. Um, I represent the Nailbourne Ward, um, where we've had issues year on and year out that require tankering. And the, this means that every time the water table gets high, the tankers are in the villages, taking the sewage out, out of the system and, and driving it away. And this happens week after week after week, year after year after year. It's not you know, a rare occurrence anymore. I know you've done work on the system, uh, but when I questioned your, um, I'm also Kent County Council, and I questioned your colleague David Murphy about this and asked him when we were going to see improvements. And he, he pretty much said nothing was planned. You know, you know, tankering is going to be the solution forever. And, and that's just not really acceptable. You know, people in these villages are paying the same to have their waste taken away as everybody else. And yet they have to put up with with tankers all the time. And, and it's right that you're putting in all this investment in on the coast and everything else, but we really need some of that investment to go into the villages to, to cope with, with the problems that are ongoing, because it just seems like we're, we're being ignored. So what I really want to, to hear from you is that we are gonna see an investment problem, an investment solution there, and that we're gonna see an end to tankering at some point, because it is just not acceptable. Thanks, Mike. Lawrence? I'll pick that up. Thank you. Um, I entirely agree. Um, one of our pathfinders, uh, um, which is not in this area, it's in Andover, but you appreciate these are trials, so we're really just testing te techniques and um, technology to fix these. But one of our pathfinders is in look, some small, small little villages just on the outskirts of Andover. Um, and that is entirely with this issue. So where well, you've got water coming in through cracks in, 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 in the pipes, and that is therefore inundating the system, and then we're having to deploy tankers to be able to control that. So for that Pathfinder, Pathfinder project, um, we are trialling new technology from Germany, which is basically, it is a little, for those of you who might remember this, remember the, the Radwell of the sort of 1970s and 80s, where you sort of squeeze it in, in your radiator and it fixes the holes from the inside. So there is a technology that comes from Germany that does just that for sewage pipes. Mm -hmm. And we're trialing that at the moment in the Andover area. Um, if that's successful, then um, surface, it isn't just about surface water separation. It's also about infiltration reduction, which stops things like this tankering. So the Pathfinder approach um, that we're identifying is telling us how much it costs, what do we need to do, and what's the most economic way, such that we can then build the case around that mm -hmm. to go forward um, to our regulator off what in our next in big investment plans um, with a more region-wide um, antidote to this blight, because it is absolutely horrible having to put up your tankers, you know, in, in, in your little villages. So I hope that gives you some heart that whilst I might not have a fix for today. Um, the pathfinders are absolutely aimed at exactly that problem area as well. Thank you. Okay, Louise. I absolutely echo the point that Councillor Soles just made about more attention being paid to the rural wards. Absolutely. I'm a rural councillor myself, so I would absolutely... Um, love it if more attention could be paid to those rural areas okay so i have two two questions um i've kind of amalgamated them from questions that have come from residents so the first one is um how are newer homes with on-site uh, sewage treatment affected by the lack of main sewage um and also for those homes that the newer homes that have the on-site sewage what are Southern Water doing to ensure the waste collected from those properties um, isn't spilled and any pollution is safeguarded, um, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, I have Warren? to confess, I'm familiar with this subject. I'm still relatively new back into the company. I don't know whether any of my colleagues do. If not, we might have to take it offline. Yeah, Louise, sorry, I, I was struggling to hear a little bit there. You said that, developments that are getting their own 
wastewater treatment works? How are we ensuring that they're effective? Um, the, the question there was two questions the first one was essentially how effective are those on-site sewage in comparison to mains sewage um, and then also um, the, the sewage that is being taken away from those newer homes what are southern water doing to ensure there's no pollution spillage etc etc um toby uh, that may be one where you might have a better expertise i mean i would expect any any wastewater treatment that is put in place, Louise, would be consented by the Environment Agency if it's discharging. So it would have to meet performance standards. Um, small small treatment works can be very effective, um, you know, particularly with my accent. If you go in, into some of the rural areas there, there are small package plants that are implemented quite frequently. So it's not unusual. Um, and in some cases, actually, it's better for the environment if we have much more um, disparate um, sort of presentation of effluent back to the environment. So that would be the answer to that one there. I would expect that that would be an environment agency um, matter for the, the consents. Absolutely spot on, Ian. Yeah, correct. Um, and then the second one, um, in terms of, again, I think it still falls to the, the environment agency. We, we, don't, we don't have authority over people who build their own treatment works. That, that's done by the, the environmental regulator. I mean, we would always give advice if we're asked, and we do work with people in some of these smaller developments in terms of what type of package plants we've seen that work. Toby, was there anything else that we might add to that? Um, no, it should be they should be operating to exactly the same standards that uh, the regulator would expect from uh, expect from us. Um, uh, and we, we're uh, currently <laughs> engaging. Um, there's a new development for that, that might discharge the Canterbury treatment works that we are working with the developer and it's quite a sizable development in terms of what's the better option um is it better to have independent treatment or is it better to bring it to Canterbury recognizing the big issues that we have with phosphorus in particular in and around this region thank you is that okay louise because i think the question's great, but I don't know if you got an answer because it's not yes, necessarily. I, I think I think the con I think the concern is the waste when it's collected. Where does it go? Um, is it being taken away safely? And I think also one of the concerns that I've had brought to me in the last week um, was from a newer resident who's heard that there will be in excess of 40 trucks um, to the newer developments in Sturry, um, removing that waste. From the property so you know when you look at sort of um our climate targets having that many trucks going in and around small rural areas that's not really a, po a positive so that was really the, the concern um i'm happy if you you know if you want to come back to me outside of the meeting that's fine but i do i would like to have something to take back right. to my residents well Luz, could you when, yep. if it's better we'll take it offline and have a specific yep. discussion that right. sounds to me as if it's someone who's having to develop a plan and this is an interim measure that they're carrying it from a reception tank in the new development until such time as the plant's online. Equally, it could be that they're, that they're waiting to build a pipeline to one of our treatment works. But if we get the specific site, we'll be able to give you a much more specific answer. That's great. If we could have a chat, that would be amazing. Yeah. Thank we'll, you, Ian. We'll, pick, we'll pick up on that outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Just on a, uh, a practical question, it seems from Andrea's comments that occasionally we get residents who essentially have problems with specific storm overflows. I've got a case at the moment about uh, a lady who essentially gets uh, backfilling into her garden for a problem which Southern Water initially came out seven years ago to look at. Um, can we have a clear delineation? Is it possible from this meeting to have perhaps an email which councillors could use to identify specific pieces of casework uh, on uh, issues, so essentially we can feed it in. Sometimes I just end up going through the engineering department. It would be very useful just to know who we speak to, not complicate things, we'll send it too high, but essentially make sure it gets fed into the right place. Thanks, Chris. Okay, I don't know if anyone's gonna pick that up from Southern Water, but that does seem a sensible suggestion. So we know as councillors who to contact because it's so frustrating sending an email in and it just goes from one person to another and nobody ever gets answered. It goes back to the point from earlier, it's communication. Good communication will help win people's hearts and minds mm. and 
we as councillors need to be able to support you to get what's right and best for our residents. Yep, agreed. I think Lawrence, can we pick that one up offline in terms of maybe it's a stakeholder uh, or ops, very specific ops context as well. Okay. Yeah, if, you, if you give us if you give us the details, Chris, again, we'll just come back very specifically on that one. I'll send them into Lawrence. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to address without without the specifics. I'm probably actually looking to. Thank you. I've got an email which has come in from a uh, fellow councillor who's in a rural ward, and they have got similar issues in their ward, which I think once again will have to be taken offline. So I will speak to them to get them to provide more information because I think we can't have these constant backflow into people's homes and i think it's horrendous for people and if we can be working to try and solve these problems as soon as possible yeah because seven years is not adequate no. No. no it's crazy we absolutely wouldn't want that in any way but the, the, as soon as we can get the details then we can look into it okay thank you okay so if there are no further questions on theme five we will now go on to theme, sorry, theme four. We go on to theme five, which is strategic development. I'm going to ask Andrea to read out questions from the members of the public on this one, please. Andrea? Yeah, thank you, Director Chair. Um, the, I've got a series of questions. These are actually from Councillor Ian Stockley, so uh, who's not on the committee. So, okay. We are told that the private water treatment works to be installed in some of our strategic development sites will operate and produce nutrient neutral treated waste water output. This will then be released into the River Stour catchment area. Can you explain why Southern Water is unable to operate at the same zero nutrient output? It's understood that the limits that Southern Water are licensed to discharge nitrogen and phosphates will be greatly reduced in the near future but this is still not nutrient neutral. Can Southern Water please use any influence they may have within the government to encourage or compel new developments to install rainwater harvesting and grey water reuse? The issue of increased rainfall volumes and the effects this has on the day-to-day -day treatment of sewage that is discharged into our coastal waters, which is clearly unacceptable, must be resolved before the rainwater gets to the treatment works and then overwhelms it. The water treatment process has a byproduct that is known as sludge, that is the solids that have been removed from the water. This is normally collected into tanks at treatment works and then, in the case of Southern Water, shipped to the Canterbury Sewage Works on Sturry Road for specialised and lengthy treatment that converts this sludge into a dry product currently used for fertiliser on some farm crops. Is it planned for the treated wastewater to be hauled away by many lorries and dumped into our coastal treatment works in order for it to go out to sea? And what happens to the sludge element from these private development, developers' treatment works like the one proposed at Sturry. Southern Water have said that they don't have the licenses or facilities to take third parties sludge or wastewater for treatment. Please could Southern Water clarify their position in this matter. As the planning authority, we need to have this information as a matter of urgency. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so I don't know who's gonna tackle that from Southern Water, whether it's a bit of lots of different people. I'd assume. I think it will be a yeah. few. Lawrence, which ones do you want to pick off? I might I might start and then we might. I mean, it's quite a technical subject that's been brought up there in question. Yeah. So um, I don't want to try and keep taking too much offline, but that may be necessary. Mm. Um look, one thing that we've got to, we've got a we definitely got a challenge reputationally is is um is Lawrence, you keep freezing. I think we've lost them. Unfortunately. Getting can you hear me again? Yeah, oh, yeah, no problem. yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we need to um, slowly, slowly through our own performance improvement, largely, but also carefully manage back, is this complete myth that we take sludge and we go and dump it in the environment, or we take raw sewage and we dump it. That does not happen. There are overflows triggered by major storm events. Um, and that is the route through this. It's the overflows that is the problem that we've been talking to you a lot about this evening. So we don't take sludge and we don't go and dump it into the environment. That used to happen 30 years ago or 40 years ago, maybe, where barges used to drive out in, in, into, the, into, the, uh, in, into the sea. That does not happen in this day, day, day and age. So we can put that, that 
to bed really. Um, Canterbury um, is a really important slow treatment, treatment centre. We also produce renewable energy um, with the methane that is produced as a, as a byproduct as well as a, a, a agricultural mm -hmm. fertiliser. Um, the problem that we have, I think the question was around how do you take private sludge or private um, uh, loads into our treatment works. Um, that does give us um, quite a severe headache because this is where legislation isn't kind to us. And this is where I might hand over to my colleague, Toby, who will be able to build, build on, on, mm. on, on this point. But the water industry is governed by regulations around the water industry management of sludge, which is governed by the Environment Agency. Um, for pure commercial activity outside the water sector, um, that's governed by a different set of, of laws. And... Um, <laughs> It is very. I'm afraid you're freezing again, Lawrence. Um, into uh, it's not Toby. You might have to pick up from me in terms of the law and, and the legislation. I don't know what's up my internet. I'll try and fix it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what you heard from Lawrence, but um, uh, in 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 essence, the uh, the material that is produced from. Uh, from our works uh, is uh, is is highly treated, it's highly regulated, uh, and then the biosolids that are uh, are produced are then uh, are then recovered to uh, recover to land, agricultural land, um, in uh, as as a fertilizer or, or or soil enhancer, and that is you know that is highly regulated by the uh, by the Environment Agency. There's an industry code of practice, um, uh, and we apply by uh, apply. Um, uh, are regulated by a, a series of, or farmers are regulated by a series of other other regulations like um, nitrate vulnerable zones and uh, uh, rules like that. So, um, uh, yes, uh, material is produced at Canterbury. Uh, yes, it is a, a highly regulated process, and yes, it is recovered to uh, recover to land to benefit uh, benefit agricultural crops, and that is a highly uh, highly regulated process. Um, on the first question, uh, yes, uh, I mean we've we've touched on this previously. I think particularly from uh, questions from Councillor Clark. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We uh, we seek to influence uh, our national government to um, you know uh, increase the amount of um, you know rainwater harvesting, grey water, grey water usage. Um, uh, I think the the more that we can all talk up those sorts of um, those sorts of approaches and technologies, are uh, the better. Uh, uh, so be yeah, if I probably. just picked up on the package plants, Andrea. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I think that speaks to Louise's earlier question. So, yeah. so why would a discrete package plant um, have the ability to be more nutrient neutral? Well, it's not picking up surface water. It's not picking up everything that comes off the land from agriculture. Um, so there's no nitrogen. There's no phosphorus getting washed into that system. Um, it will only be picking up what's coming from the house. Uh, and the foul sewage. Now, there's a lot of pee, I mean that is phosphorus, comes from houses. Uh, that is one of the main component elements of detergents which are used for cleaning clothes. Uh, so that's one of the big inflow areas. But it will be more discreet uh, in those areas. So a package plant, which is why I say sometimes that might be a better answer, is sometimes quite well placed to deal with that type of stuff. Whereas when you bring it into uh, a much bigger treatment works with perhaps 30 or 40,000 population attached to it, sometimes more, and all the surface water coming into it, and all the industry, the sources of phosphorus, the sources of nitrogen are, are much greater. So there's a much greater inflow, much greater fluxes and flows coming into that system. Does that make sense, I think, in terms of how that, that those discrete systems might work? And yeah. I, think, I think for us, what that speaks to is it's kind of like the recycling of trying to reduce at source is the best answer. Um, so making sure we are using less of it and taking more out of the system rather than relying on end of pipe solution, which those examples I gave you, where we're trying to reduce the phosphorus discharge down to effectively neutral, then the amount of capital investment, the amount of energy, the amount of carbon that's been used to deliver that 
is quite at odds with improving the environment. It is absolutely reducing phosphorus flow into the Pevensey levels, but it is increasing carbon footprint at quite a, 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 an alarming rate. Okay, thank you. Got a couple of questions from councillors. We've got Louise and then Mel. So Louise. Thank you. I'll try and keep this as brief because I realise we're on hour three now. Um, so I'll, I'll try and keep this brief if I can. You you referred to the the, the Canterbury um, facility that you have, which actually just sits to the edge of my council ward um, on Sturry Road. Um, you may not be aware or you may be aware of all the development that we've had in, in and around Sturry, in Hurston, in Hearn. How are Southern Water going to cope with all of that development? Um, are you going to expand your facility at all? What plans do you have uh, to, to future-proof the, um, the new houses that will be coming forward in the near future? Thank you. Lawrence, have you got the Canterbury um, expansion plan? Hopefully, hopefully you, might, you might be able to hear me. Um, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of the sewerage system, as you've heard from us, that isn't normally the constraint because it's about surface water is the problem. That new, all that new housing coming in, particularly if it's coming in with more efficient from an urban drainage point of view, housing, that, that, that won't cause us any issues at all. Um, it may seem a large number of properties, but proportionally will still be very, very small. We, we, we have a, um, a process that connects our developer services teams with our um, asset management teams internally, which basically means that those new developments um, will be designed into the next treat treatment works upgrade. Um, we can come back to you on more specifically, you know, what, what that time scale is and when we think that capacity is eroded that we need to make the next extension, um, but it isn't in the immediate future. Um, the, the, plant, the existing facility um, has capacity to be able to deal with with um, all of the sort of current currently forecast work. Um, but we can take that and come back to you and let, let you know when that capacity sort of runs out, if that would help. Yeah, that, that would be great. I know we said that we would talk outside of the meeting anyway, um, but one of the other concerns from residents are, I mentioned earlier, at the ageing infrastructure um, through Surrey, which is was a small rural village. It's grown quite a lot since then. So um, the meetup of the newer housing developments to the existing old infrastructure, um, some of my residents foresee problems there. So if we're going to pick up outside of the meeting, that would be amazing. Thank you. That'd be great. We'll, 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 we'll arrange for someone from our developer services team to talk you through um, how that how that works and how we've looked at the capacity. And if there are any issues on the back of it, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mel. Oh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, I think me and Louise are on, on the same, asking, asking the same questions tonight, but because mine's very similar. Um, when will this, it's from a resident, when will the Story Wastewater Treatment Plant be upgraded to allow for the developments already passed to be built? Um, I think uh, Louise has said that we could take some of that information outside the meeting, but I think uh, quite, there are there is there are some existing um, residence groups available. It might be nice if you were you to attend one of those meetings and speak to them directly as well. They, they might appreciate that. Um, also, another question is, when will you publish your improvements plans for the aging processing plants and what is the side of the budget in rough figures uh, that they have allocated, that you have allocated? Okay, thanks, Mel. Yeah, I think we, Toby, we did send out and yeah. publish all, all the investment plans that all uh, local authorities recently. We can update that again, Mel, potentially, if it's not come your way. We we can okay. and I've, as it happens, I've seen an updated version today. So we'll 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 get that uh, we'll get that uh, circulated uh, as soon as we can. Okay. Okay. Thank and then you. the question about the water snowy waste water treatment plant to be upgraded. Okay, can we'll pick up on that specifically, um, Lawrence, Toby, in yeah, terms of the investment it. plans, as what, what is planned for that. Uh, one of your suggestions might actually be that maybe we should just have a meeting on one of the sites uh, yep. and, and get people together. Might be a, a quicker and more efficient way of doing it, perhaps. Please, Mel, if that was 
some of your sounds, new new Sounds tips. good. Sounds good. And and also going back to an earlier comment right at the beginning, the smell from the Starry Waterworks is just not going away at all. Okay. Okay. Louise. Just going to say Mel just made a, a good point about the residence groups, but um some residents obviously aren't aren't on uh, social media or anything like that. I'm sure one of the local parish councils would would happily um, invite you down if you if that was a, a different way to go. But I think Mel's right. We're on the same, same wavelength. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. I, I just think there are so many of these issues out there. From we've got May Street from Council Stockless questions which also brings in Sturry Road which also brings into the issues which Andrew, Ashley, Val and people in Whitsford have brought in and I think it's this joined up approach tonight is really important but I think for most people it's also the specifics for their own local area which is what we need and I think those specifics are good for us to hear but it's also communication again Barry, I know we've talked about this. No I agree Joe, I agree. I, I support that entirely. I'd like to pick up on something you said, Ian, about your weighing up the difference between carbon footprints of lots of trucks going back and forth to the p-values going into the water cycle. So who, how is that decision regulated? Because obviously everything will have an environmental impact and we all, all are looking to carbon neutrality. Ian, in his question, talked about lorries going back and forth to Surrey Road for the sludge to be converted into nutrient-rich farming products. So how's that worked out? Who makes those choices in terms of what is a priority? Air quality, water quality, whatever. And how's that decided? Toby? Well, uh, not, not in the forensic way that you would, uh, you would want to think, Joe. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, there are uh, environmental limits set by the regulator for air, for water, for land, uh, and then permits are uh, issued uh, issued accordingly. Uh, in theory, the the planning system takes account of uh, things like uh, things like trafficking. Um, uh, we used to have uh, regional spatial strategies, which uh, you know set some of these uh, some of these environmental parameters for uh, for planning um, but uh, now there is not the same uh, you know sort of um, joined up uh, approach to to receptors uh, although the environment agency when uh, when issuing uh, particularly permits to us for you know, discharging to the environment do do consider uh, other uh, other aspects um, but it is not um, it is not how you would like to imagine, I'm afraid. Yeah, not not as good. Although, Joe, I would I would say that um, when we look to sludge, um, we digest sludge, um, and we capture the methane from it as well. And sludge has to be treated for certain numbers of days in digester tanks before it can be taken for beneficial reuse. And there is a scale issue there, so it doesn't work at the scale of a small rural treatment works. Um, the digesting process would not work, it would not be efficient, we wouldn't be able to capture the methane. So it is part of the calculation in terms of transport journeys and trips versus what we can produce uh, on a bigger regional sludge treatment centre versus what we make back uh, in terms of energy recovery. And that does get a balance. Although I would agree with Toby that there is a way to go still in terms of things like aquatic atmospheric uh, regulation and, and assessment of those type of things. Can I just come back on that? I think what's clear here from what you've said tonight is that there's not a joined up approach from all different agencies and all different people. And what we're saying is you do your bit and that can be stymied by government regulations or other water companies and other partner organisations, not necessarily all singing from the same hymn sheet. Because I know that you're not allowed to take third party sludge. Is that correct? Because surely that would make sense if you could help another smaller company to dispose of their sludge. But I think these are bigger questions which I think need to be tackled. And perhaps now is not the time to tackle it. No, and it's wider and broader. I mean, there are different types of sludge 
uh, different compatibility, industrial content, sludge can wipe out uh, digesters overnight because it's a biological process. Um, so I, I don't mean to be demeaning. Yeah, it's more it's more complex. It, than it's way. not for it's not for tonight. Yeah. As Louise said, we're three hours in. Yeah. And okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. We got to Mel, and then we move on to theme six. Thank you, Joe. I think I think you kind of answered it. It was just another question on the sludge with a sorted of biogas in the UK. Okay. Demand. So, you know, what, what steps are you going to take to make green energy from waste? But, I mean, that's possibly a future plan or strategic development, I'm not sure. But you kind of answered it already. Yeah, no, we do. I mean, some of our sites, Lawrence, is much better. I mean, some of our sites are almost self-sufficient in energy uh, because of the biomethane recovery and what we do in CHP. For example, is that fair, Lawrence? That we're getting close to that sort of level. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're, we're down, I, mean, I could talk for a, a long time about the smell, but it's not just the um, expansion of bio biomethane and what that can do. It's also at the moment we're looking into the choices around what we what we do with that gas in the future. Do we convert it into hydrogen? Do we do gas to grid? Do we do gas to vehicles? There's a whole bunch of very strategic choices which we're looking into, but that is definitely a topic for another evening. Thank you. Okay. What we now do, we'll move on to theme six, which are future plans. So I'm going to ask Andrea if she has any questions from the public, because looking at my list, it appears we've got Derek has some questions and Councillor Dawkins have got questions. Is there anything else from the public, Andrea? Yeah, well, what I've got, Chair, is I've got a couple of questions from residents that were received via Councillor Dawkins. Um, they may have partially been answered already, but I'll read them out since I've Thank got you. them, if that's OK. So what plans do you have for scaling up both supply and waste management to cope with the thousands of new homes currently planned and under construction in the Canterbury area? Ditto increasing extreme weather events, both dry and wet. And how will you work with developers in the future to ensure that housing has adequate sewage, wastewater and water systems in place? Um, I think I would say that we've addressed all of those questions that we've gone through in the last three hours in quite some detail, if that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. OK, got a couple of questions from Derek. <laughs> well, th th thank you. Uh, it's been a long wait, but um, uh, in fact, this has been more of an education than um, uh, raising questions. Uh, my fellow councillors have asked virtually everything I was going to ask. The only one thing I would say is that um, um, I'm surprised to learn, not being on the planning committee, that new housing, new some of the new housing still doesn't have se segregated water channels. Um, is that something that we as a council can impl you know, influence? Because um, the more we can get that segregated, it must be better. Uh, and the other thing is um, I, I'm totally aware, well, I am now aware of how difficult the existing older properties are and how you, you, the, the difficult it is to segregate the, the systems. I live in a Victorian house and uh, the drains and the sewerage and all that sort of thing must be uh, well. They're over 120 years old, and maintenance for those must be must be uh, a real devil for you. So, is there a, pres or a prescribed plan for those, or maintenance, or do you just have to wait until it fails? That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So, just uh, picking up the last point first, really. Um, so, we are. Um, our plans for surface water separation, as we talked about earlier, are also about slowing the flow down. So well, we do understand, really do understand that, you know, there's a number of properties which are much older in nature. It will be far too intrusive to actually try and physically disconnect it. So in those circumstances, Nick is trialling things like smart water butts, green infrastructure, which can just slow that runoff down as it comes down, down the gutter before it goes into the sewer system that can have a massive impact and a massive improvement um, on sewer overflows. So we are we are actually looking at those those kind of solutions for all kinds of um, housing. In terms of mandating it, um, my my honest view is that it, it's I think I think it is very difficult for, for us to do it's not under our direct control. We can sit and we can shout shout about it, but we don't have 
we don't have planning law under our control, much as we might like to in this particular circumstance. I think probably uh, you know, this is something where the county, where the um, local authorities and where government needs to start coming together. And it feels like maybe that's something that we could start to build as a bit of a coalition for change on standard policy to be implemented throughout the entire region around not just sustainable drainage, but water efficiency as well. Um, that feels like something where we need to build a bit of a coalition of force to get that stand standard change because it's there's a lot of people involved in that process. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I understand. I wasn't I wasn't saying that <laughs> you were at fault. It's, it's, it's a problem yeah, with the whole it's planning problem. process because yeah. I'm I'm constantly surprised that with new housing estates there are no rain butts. There's no rainwater collection at all, anything like that, which to me seem very simple um, solutions to the problems. And in fact, I, I was quite intrigued by the um, uh, smart uh, rain butt. Um, yeah. Is that something that you can actually buy? Because I, yeah. I'd, be qu I'd be quite keen to get one of those just to, just to try it out for myself. I'm yeah. sure we can come to an arrangement, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, just, next, just send me a link. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Got a question from Louise. Yes, hello. I think I referred to this earlier, but I will just quickly um, mention it again. Your um, Keep It Clear campaign, um, I was reading about that on your website. Uh, what are you doing to um, make the public aware of this? Do you have any initiatives in place? I appreciate that it's online, but I, did, I mentioned earlier that obviously not everybody has um, resources at home to use the internet so what is it that's that you're actually doing um positively to get the message out there um about what you should and shouldn't be putting down your sink thank you um, I'll pick this one up yeah we're, we're to begin by i think it's, well uh, we're to begin yeah. quite in the day uh, and louise I, I completely endorse what you're saying as well obviously whilst we accept or we take for granted the internet's widely available some people still rely on pen and paper. Um, we have the Unflushables campaign, which is based around the three Ps, poo, paper and pee, which needs to go down the toilet. Everything over and above that is classed and unflushable, causes blockages in the sewers. Um, I worked in operations for a number of years, going out and looking at sewer systems. And um, you'd find nappies, you'd find food carcasses down there. So I think people have the assumption that the toilet is a waste disposal unit as well. So you can flush it and it's gone, it's forgotten about. That's not always the case. We're losing body as well. Documentation as well, which goes out. And it, um, it allows us to just educate people on that side of it, to say there's responsibility for everyone. 95% um, of people, I'm sure, I'm, I'm grabbing a figure out the air, will we'll be fully, fully aware of that. But there will be some people who, just who generally don't understand that some of the stuff doesn't need to go to the toilet, certainly the amount of household wipes that are available now. So that's the main method. We obviously have a big, big presence on our website. The campaign is on paper. We have people going out into the catchments, visiting schools, visiting community groups, get the message across to actually make it interactive, to lift sewers and say, this is how a sewer works. People are still fascinated by that. So yes, there is there is a big campaign. And if you wish, I can, um, I, I, I can send you some of the information offline that we issue to community groups, schools and the general public. Would that be helpful? That would be great. I mean, in terms of um, sort of local things that we have going out, like district life and stuff like that, I'm I'm sure that a spread in, in that um, would be much appreciated for those Wonderful. who don't have access to the internet. But yes, if you would like to share that information yeah, with me, course. that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, re it's a really big, and it, it's not to point fingers and say it's just to say everyone's got a responsibility for the upkeep of the sewer and it's um especially with children if you get the message across to the children they can go home from school and tell the parents and it becomes a point of interest and fun for them and the parents um then think oh, okay that that makes sense so you can use the children as a conduit to get the message across so it's quite it, it, it's quite a good tactic if you will if that's the right word to actually get the wider message across and the kids are obviously fascinated by poo as all children are so yes we've uh, hit on an interesting theme for them uh, and we are back, Louise. I've just looked at my diary. I've got two school visits coming up in the next couple of weeks. We're finally back to be able to get out and speak to people again. It's been two years of not doing that. Um, so more than happy to have people in, in your area as well come out to, to schools and do some of the school visits. 
On the other side, we do also have ex-police officers who now work for us in terms of enforcement of um, fat traps, for example, in businesses. We don't like to prosecute people. That's not our approach. We like to educate. So they will go out and they will do inspections. They will issue notices uh, where we need to, to try to improve. So there is quite a lot that goes on. But I think, you know, for us as a team, we probably recognised a couple of years ago we needed to do a whole lot more uh, in that communication space. Sounds like we've got quite a bit to catch up on outside of the meeting now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Rather than just sending things directly to Louise and also Nick and the smart water butts and other things which are going to be sort of mentioned, you're going to send out. It would be great if they could be sent out to Pippa and then Pippa can make sure they go to all councillors because the things which have been talked about would be of great benefit to all of us across the district. And then we can share it with fellow councillors as well if they want it because... We've got of a lot. Course, of Joe, that's a good suggestion. I think I'm right in right thinking that Andrew or Pippa will summarise the questions and the stuff that we're going to deal with offline, and we can amalgamate that information. Would that would that be right? Would I be right in that thinking? Yes, that would be really good. Wonderful. So that's what we can do. Thanks, so Joe. anything we want to follow up on, we will send to you. But also any sort of literature and stuff would be great in that way. So it's that it's that yeah. partnership. It's that talking to one another is vital. Okay. Yeah, by all means. Thank you. It's really good. To Great idea. Yes, let's do, let's do that. What we'll do now is we'll move on to theme seven, the last theme of the night, which is miscellaneous. Some of these I'm guessing you won't be able to answer tonight, and I believe we might have to go out to um, tech residents to actually ask their permission for details to be sent on to you. But Andrea, yes, and we have we have. Three under miscellaneous that I can read out to you. So firstly from Graham Rose, uh, what percentage of Southern Water customers are currently subject, subject to using a water meter? Against our wishes, we were moved onto a water meter several years ago. Our water bills have subsequently increased and we currently pay £83 per month as a family of four adults. Why are we subject to this additional cost and have been for several years? When can we expect all Southern Water customers to be moved on to a compulsory basis to use a water meter? And then I have a question from Thanet Fishermen's Association. Will Southern Water be holding a similar special meeting with Thanet District Council, where Thanet fishermen and Thanet businesses can raise questions relevant to the area? And lastly, a question from a resident. Uh, will you continue to stop paying out big bonuses till issues are resolved? Thank you, Andrea. So, I don't know who's going to pick these up. I know we've contacted, we've discussed the one on yeah. bonuses already. Yeah. So we've so got a water meter. Uh, I can pick up on the water meters. It's something that intrigued me when I first arrived here. So Southern Water was the first uh, company to go for compulsory meter. Um, and our coverage now, I think, is 89%. Lawrence Nick, I'm just kind of in that sort of region. Um, so what we're really left with is the hard to fit ones. So multi-story flats, those type of things, which are more difficult. The benefit of uh, metering, uh, you can only do it if you're in a water scarce area. Um, this is the most water scarce area I've ever worked in. And I've lived and worked in many countries around the world. And it's because of population density, um, availability of fresh water, chalk stream abstraction reductions, quite rightly. Um, so metering for me is a, is a good thing. And consumption reduced by 16%. Um, so, you know, it was really significant. Uh, we are trying to say that we believe that should be the case across the country. It, it does seem strange that and when we started this conversation, one of the most valuable things we have, water is a food. Uh, and it's the most valuable food that we that we choose not to uh, do the consumption element of it, so that people can understand and be more water wise on it. Um, so we'd be keen to see, uh, and we are developing that further now uh, in terms of looking at and forget smart metering. I think it's a it's just a wrong term. There's no there's no real smart yet, but we are starting to look at that now in terms of building apps um, that will allow. For example, all water consumptive devices have their own acoustic signal. Um, so smart for us would be you've left the bath tap running upstairs. You've got a leaking toilet, whether you know it or not, because of the, the way the signal comes through. And we're doing some developmental work on that at the present moment in time. Um, other things for us in terms of bills, um, 
we are now working with Consumer Council for Water in terms of really helping customers to be able to. So with a seasonal that's been mentioned many times, we probably build people at the wrong time of year, you know, around about November time quite often when they're in between seasons, for example. So we're looking at can we have much more flexible billing um, off of our metering stock now as well. So it opens up a host of different things. I think for me, if something is valuable, then measure how you consume it. You wouldn't go into a petrol station, fill up and kind of walk in and say, I think I think I use this much and I'll pay you this much. Um, I don't see why water should be different, especially since as I started um, earlier, that now that we've published the, the future plans into 2080, this country faces an enormous water deficit. If we can, if we continue to consume it in the way we currently do, uh, anywhere between 1.2 and 2 billion liters per day uh, in the future, which you know I've got four children, hopefully grandchildren coming soon as well. Um, you know I want to see those generations having resilient futures. So I think that would be my answer on metering. That that's why we do it. Um, I think ultimately it allows us to look at things like variable tariffing. Um, so if you if you do need to consume more water, and we can see that, we can actually price water accordingly. If you choose to use water in a less frugal way and you want to pay more for it, then by all means, we should be able to do that as well. So I think it opens up lots of different avenues for us. Thank you. Then we had a question from the Fanet Fishermen's Association about holding a meeting with Fanet District Council. I think that's... That's a, I mean that that's a yes we we will do. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean we speak with them fairly regularly. I mean uh, mm. uh, Barry and I were speaking to the leader this morning. So um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. We've now got a couple of questions from counters. We've got Neil and then Andrew. Yeah, thank you. I think just to go around full circle back to the perception I mentioned at the start of this meeting. Um, as um, people, professionals, very knowledgeable in the industry, if you were out for the day and didn't have access to any up-to-date data, would you go swimming in Tankerton and would you eat Woodstable shellfish? Thanks, Neil. I don't know who's going to pick up that one. What I will say is Woodstable's a lovely place and well worth visiting for a holiday. And then you spend three days in Woodstable, then four days in Herne Bay. Yeah, I mean, well, for me, I think the the better the information you have, I think we've all agreed on that, the, the easier it is to make that decision. Um, you know, so for me, if I look to some of the, the rivers, for example, they're not at bathing water standard, um, and therefore they need to be brought to bathing water standards to allow people to bathe in them. Um, I eat a lot of shellfish, um, I have to say, um, so I'm not sure if I've eaten which I think I have. Um, but I am a frequent consumer of, of, of oysters um, and it's something that I enjoy doing. So uh, I guess in terms of that type of question, um, what really is behind that question is, do we want to make sure that we're improving systems and processes to make absolutely certain that we have high quality um, bathing waters, we have high quality um, oysters, etc.? And yes, we do. Of course we do. And we want to do more about that as well. Okay, I'm going to say come back on that sorry can i just say yeah i fully understand your answer i also understand neil's answer but it's the fact that people in a coastal town who are reliant upon a tourist industry and the farming and the fishing industry and if people are not confident in the product whether it's water or for shellfish it's going to have a major damage and it's all well and good telling us that this is going to happen in the future and you need access to apps, you need access to the data. But at the moment, there is not necessarily the trust in it. I think that's where we are. Is that fair, Neil? Absolutely that. It's down to the perception of a one-off time you could just go swimming or not. Because let's be fair, uh, we're a coastal town, as you say, Joe. Uh, we rely on the water for leisure and employment. We've heard from uh, James Green and the Whistable Fishers. People shouldn't have to look up data on a constant basis to check that they can eat the produce that we've had here for thousands of years. But hopefully we'll get there. But I will no doubt be long dead and buried by the time we do. Thank you. May I, may I just pick up? Sure. 
Yes, Christian Lawrence. I'd have no hesitation at all in eating Whistable Bay oysters. No hesitation whatsoever. And I think any of us would be ex exactly the same. I would always think about swimming just just after a storm, though. And I probably wouldn't swim straight after a storm. And that's not just because there might have been a sewage overflow. Um, that's also because there is a lot of road runoff with everything that there is from catalytic converters and all those kind of things. There's agricultural runoff into rivers. I think swimming after storms is something that I'd always have to think about. But the very next day, I'll give it a day and then I'll be straight in the sea without any hesitation. Thank you, Lawrence, for your honesty and openness on that. And I'm sure the Whitstable fishermen and oyster company will be pleased that you feel confident that you would eat their products. Well, with a bit of luck when we meet, I might get some. You never know. We'll, that'll be the test of the relationship, I think, okay. at that point. <laughs> OK, thank you. Last question is Andrew, who's got the lovely picture of Herne Bay behind him. OK, Andrew. Yeah, it took me a bit of time to get a sand in the right place, but I've, I've done it. I've, I've managed it and I've moved that old tree from outside one of the restaurants. And it's pretty good now. Um, <laughs> can I ask, it really, it, this is for just a follow up for me, please. But can I ask that somebody contacts the people that were flooded out in Herne Bay and make sure that they've been looked after properly? Because I've still got people telling me and there's a, 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 a local business there telling me that they haven't been compensated or anything. Can I ask that to be followed through and make sure everything is concluded and I get to hear that it's concluded? Because if I've still got people out there that are thinking that they, they rightfully deserve something, I need to know whether they don't or whether they do and, and everything else. But if they do need to be compensated, then we need to crack on with that because obviously we are now, this was August last year, it's, you know, it's, a long, it's a long way gone, six months plus. Okay, thank you very much. If you can do that for us, I'll be very grateful. We will. Thank you, Andrew. What I was going to say is we've heard a lot of general questions tonight, but we've also had a lot of very, very specific questions from members of the public and also from ward councillors who are in this meeting and also from ward councillors who aren't here but have sent questions in via their colleagues. Where we have specifics about individuals, can I request that councillors here tonight can send those questions into either Pippa or Andrew with the details so we can actually then forward them on to Southern Water so Southern Water can actually look into that and try to get these things moving for people. Because as we've heard, some people have been suffering for a long, long time with this. And I think if we, from one thing moving forward, can actually tackle somebody's problem so they don't get backflow would be great. We're also dedicated to working with our businesses. I think we all believe that that's important for us all. So I think it's that we've had a really good, in my opinion, a really good dialogue tonight. And thank you very much, Southern Water, and all of you for giving up your time this evening. It's been, from my perspective, three and a half hours <coughs> of very, very useful information you've provided, but hopefully you have able to see how frustrated we are having to deal with issues which aren't our fault and we're trying to get answers from people for people that we represent. Thanks, so thank you for coming tonight. I am now going to say, as there are no more questions, and it is now 9.02, I'm going to formally close this meeting and thank you all for attending and declare the meeting closed. And thank you very, very much, all of you.